Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm here again with Fernando and we're gonna be initiating the second video in the new series that we're doing on Brihad Parashara Horashastra. We're gonna be looking at chapters one through five and just talking about them and giving our, you know, limited, but hopefully insightful commentary. <laughs> All right, welcome back, man. Thanks for doing this again. Nice to see you, Lars. Let's start with chapter okay. one. I'm gonna screen share. So basically, as we've mentioned before, you know, for people who haven't seen the first video of the introduction, I strongly recommend it. When we talk about the history of the book, we talk about Parasha, we talk about Yotish, we talk a lot about, you know, specific things that we need to know before we even start reading this book, you know. And just for people to, to, to know, Brihat uh, Parasha Rahora Shastra is basically, you know, the great treatise on horoscopic astrology by Parashara, and it's basically a text that it is recounted by the conversation between Maitreya and Parashara. Parashara right. is a Yotishi, and Maitreya wants to know about astrology. So basically, in the first chapter, uh, you have uh, Maitreya, and he humbly asks uh, Parashara to please um, uh, to please explain to him uh what yotish is he 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 actually first starts saying you know how this universe came about how it will end and what's the relationships of the of the uh animals uh with the sphere of the stars and then parashara says oh this is a great question thank you for asking me and and thank you for transcribing the book <laughs> and yeah. uh you know this is a great question for the universe and you know you have to take in mind that um you know, uh, and this is a very important part, you know, uh, if you go to, I think it's uh, one through eight shloka of the first chapter, uh, a little bit up, a little bit up here, a little bit up. No, no, you're, you're in chapter. This is, is chapter this one. The creation. Offering yeah. even my like, uh, Okay, over here, over here. To, to, there you go, up, up, there you go. Uh, Horus, you know, part of the direction, decide on the pressure. I understand. I'm not sure if you said you were saying that. No, no, next page. Okay, next yeah, page. he's asking him how the universe is created here, and then here's here's the answer, right? The Parker, answer, right? and and this is a very important shloka because here Parashra starts off the book by saying who is uh, worthy of studying astrology and who is not, and this is something yeah. that, that some astrologers mention, but not all. And and, you, and he says, you know, O Brahmin, your query uh, has an auspicious purpose in it for the welfare of the universe, which is why I say praying Lord Brahma and Sri Saraswati, which is his concert, and the sun god, Surya Deva, the yeah. planets, and the cause of the creation. I shall proceed to narrate you the science of astrology as heard through Lord Brahma. Only good will follow the teaching of the science to students who, A, are peacefully predisposed. Are you peacefully disposed, Lars? Um, I mean, I've had a lot of anger, but yeah, you know. nobody's perfect. Me neither. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> honor the preceptors. Do you, do you honor your elders and your ancestors? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I do. Okay, yeah. one, one for two. Who speak only truth? Do you speak only truth? I do my best. I try to also two out of two out of three. Yeah. And who are God fearing? Are you God fearing? That I can definitely say. Yeah. Okay. We're, with great we're, confidence. Yeah. Three out of one. Three out of <laughs> three out of four. So yeah, we're worthy. All right. Now, cool. All right. now, now, woefully for every doubtlessly will it be to impart knowledge of the science to a. Are you an unwilling student? No, man. I I'm down to. You know, I'm down to learn. I'm down to rock. Yeah. I'm <laughs> yeah. Down, I'm down to rock. Uh, I got 99 problems, but being an unwilling student is not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Two, are you a heterodox? Uh, what What the hell does that mean again? That means that you are modern. You think in you think in evolution. You think in uh you think in progress. You oh, think okay. In time. You think. No, in, no, in no, no, no. Well, you know. We're not, well, me neither, but you know, we, we live in a world that's we completely did, yeah. heterodox, so we're yeah. fine. And yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody who is crafty person. Are you, cra I am a crafty person. What's, what's wrong with that, Parashara? <laughs> I think it means like somebody yeah, who, opportunistic, opportunistic. yeah, yeah, there you go. That actually, that's better than what I was going to say. So there you go. So don't study astrology if you're most of 
the if you're not most of the first four and if you're most of the latter three yeah. don't don't study it just don't do it and, and just as a side note before this shuloka he talked about these three skandhas which are very important and and oh. the three skandhas yeah it's the, the previous page but this is i we talked about this in the previous video page. yeah the three Which different is, types of astrology uh, exactly and this is something that people have to realize and this is basic yotish yotisha is a vedanga so there are six vedangas to the vedas and the vedas the six Vedanga is Yotish, and Yotish is divided into three skandhas with six Yotishangas, right? Yeah. You have the three skandhas, which is the, the Ganita or Samita, which is basically a mathematical astronomy and visual astronomy, which is Gola, you know, go, this is basically like the math you do to do physical uh, astronomy and the yeah. visual astronomy, you see the ecliptic and the planets. You yeah. have the Samita, which is basically omenology. And mm -hmm. then you have Hora, which is horoscopic astrology. And then you have the Yotishangas, which Parashara doesn't talk about, but, you know, in Prashna Marga, he talks about, which is basically um, Muhurta, electional astrology, Jataka, natal astrology, Prashna, electional astrology. No, Gola, pra Prashna is horary. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I said electional astrology two times. I'm sorry. That's okay. Prashna, which is a... a Questions. Horary astrology. Thank you. Uh, Gola, which is visual astronomy that I just mentioned, and okay. finally Ganita, which is like the mathematical part. Cool. And, and Samita is also related to a lot of things inside Jataka, Muhurta, and cool. Hora, because, because this is basically the omenology. So yeah, we have to take that out of the, uh, we have to talk about that because that's very important, and a lot of astrologers usually don't know how to explain that, uh, especially Yotishis. So basically afterwards, Parashara proceeds to explain the creation of the universe. <laughs> yeah. No big deal. No big deal, man, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the universe, this and that. And then he goes on uh, to do a Vedic explanation. Man, I, I really don't want to be a long time here because this is a very complex. Yeah. Uh, this is a very short part of the book, but it's, this is very complex. And yeah. it's basically the idea... And this is a very summarized version of it that Vishnu, uh, Lord Vishnu, uh, a quarter of Lord Vishnu is the universe. And then that quarter oh, okay. subdivides into a lot of different particularities. I don't know if you want to share the, the images. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. So this is, uh, well, this is a Taoist one that I, I got just for in case we needed it for to compare. But um, yeah, otherwise, like, these are... Can you see them? No. Oh, you can't? I, 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 I'm I only seeing the um, the Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me let me stop the share and, and try sharing some of yeah, these. Yeah, you have to stop the share, yeah. Huh, yeah, that's weird. I don't know what the deal... Um, okay, well, I'll share, I'll share this. There you go, perfect. This one. Um, so, can you see all of them or just one? Yeah, we, I, see, I see one. Perfect. Okay, cool. So hopefully this shows up well for in the video for the viewers and stuff. Um, so yeah, we have, uh, this is from a book I have on um, polarity therapy uh, called uh, The Polarity Process, Energy as a Healing Art by Franklin Sills. And this is a energy medicine system that is like, uh, kind of like, a, almost like a modernized version of Ayurveda, but it's it's much more than that. But it's heavily steeped in the traditional you know, worldview and, and whatnot. Anyway, so this author talks a little bit about the um, Sankhya philosophy, which is basically what we're looking at here, a diagram where Brahman is divided between Purusha and Prakriti, which is basically like and yang and yin, male and female, whatever. You know, Purusha is basically spirit, soul, and Prakriti is like nature, movement. So it's being and becoming, basically. And and Brahman is beyond both being and becoming, and simultaneously is both of them, right? So this is kind of the idea between this this worldview. And it's the same as in the, the Tao Te Ching, you know, like uh, which, which is why I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. But basically, this sort of be becomes or appears to become... Um, you know, these three gunas. And and I actually am, you know, it's been a while since I've really acquainted myself with this. I don't remember what Ava oh, don't worry, just Avakta go. is. Yeah, yeah. But it becomes the three gunas, which are basically neutral, positive, and negative polarities, right? Sattva preserves things, rajas initiate things, tamas uh, condenses, 
and 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 condenses things or and 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 transforms them basically you know as well so it's pretty simple to understand if you think about it as like magnetic polarity right neutral positive negative negative. and then at the, the same time in yeah. the gita they are explained also if people they are explained to, very uh, well in the latter chapters yeah. of the gita so at high rate 17th yeah. chapter if i'm not mistaken it's basically sattva is related to um uh to um uh, benevolence rajas is related to passion and tamas is related to ignorance yeah. this is in a nutshell guys so in a just... nutshell yeah um and i would also highly recommend studying sri aurobindo's essays on the bhagavad gita to understand the gunas a bit better and if you would like uh you can read my articles in the first couple issues of celestial vibes e-magazine where i quote from aurobindo and the gita quite a bit and talk about the gunas um, anyway, so just a little shameless plug there. No uh, problem. Then basically from these, the interaction of these three, when these three are not active, you have basically Brahman, you have, or as close as you can get to Brahman. But when these three are active, right, we have the cycles of creation and destruction. We have thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and so on. And this is also reflected in three types of signs of the zodiac, cardinal, fixed, and mutable which we'll talk about too when we get to that chapter a bit because Parashra says something different. So anyway, then these become Mahat, or out of this arises Mahat, which is kind of like the divine mind or the yeah, cosmic intellect, the, the, you know, the, the buddhi, what is called buddhi, the intelligent will in man. Um, it's basically, Mahat is like what creates all the archetypes and forms that are gonna be behind existence as I understand it. And then ahamkar arises from mahat, which they translate here as ego or iness, and it sort of is, but I actually think of ahamkara as more like the individualized soul self. It's not the ego in the sense of like, oh, that person is a shit and has a big ego, or like that person's so egotistical. Ahamkara is like the beginning, the nascent beginning of like an ability to be self-conscious and and we could say for Brahman to experience himself as Satchitananda, being consciousness bliss, like to experience himself through himself as everything is Brahman and the, the Amkara is sort of like, it's like the soul self, basically. It's more akin to the soul self. And then we get the Gunas again in, in terms of the, the human experience and then we get consciousness and the five elements and then all of manifestation. Nice. Did you want me to share the ones? Oh, yes, yes, you, yes, okay. please. Okay. Uh, these, this Im these images we're going to see now are specifically related to what Parashara says because in a way, uh, the, the other one first, if you would. Oh, okay, sure. Oh, what? Uh, That's my know. finger, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Was, as I was saying, you know, this is basically how Parashara says, and basically the universe is just one quarter of, uh, of, Vishnu. Uh, of Vishnu. And I'm not going to explain it, but I'm going to plug this book, if you can. This is a really good book. It's called nice. Vedic Astrology Demystified by uh, Chandra Shekhar Sharma, who is this man over here. This is a book that I've had for a couple of years, and this cool. book is amazing. Chandra Shekhar Sharma has a channel on YouTube. You can look it up. Great. This is an engineer who's also a Yotishi. He's been in Saptarishi's astrology channel. Uh, this, this book is highly, highly recommended, highly underappreciated. This man is, has written a great book on astrology. And the first thing he does in this book is explain this part of, of, of Parashara. Cool. And he gives this this uh, scheme, and then the other one. Can you show it, please, Lars? Sure. And over here, which is more or less what you showed. You know, I'm not gonna explain it because uh, we would be here like an hour, and we wanna just proceed with it. And yeah. at the same time, you kind of get the same explanation in other Vedic texts. It, they kind of defer a little bit. But it's the idea of how everything emanates from Vishnu and how everything then starts to separate through these uh, ideas of, of, of the triad, of the gunas, and then how the gunas have like a chakti 
just just like uh, you have a Prakriti and a Purusha, then you have like a Shakti, and and the other thing would be like the male energy would be like like uh, uh, the 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 god uh, figure and Shiva. how yeah I, I mean yeah exactly the the dif the different uh, aspects and how the female and the male come together and create you know the tatuas the butas you know how it creates the the inandrillas and the yanandrillas the organs of action the yeah. organs of the body and so on and so forth so yeah i mean this is this is what i wanted to discuss i don't know if you want to say anything else besides we move on but once again i strongly recommend this book if you want to learn astrology excellent it's been with me a couple of years and i love it yeah no uh this stuff is great and i would i would also recommend too like study um study plotinus too because plotinus and, and neoplatonics his, yeah neoplatonics and plotinus and whatnot and plato as well like which is you know the origin of all that because it it's very it's very similar to all this stuff it's just done in a more uh those philosophers the, the emanations right yeah the, the, those those philosophers were more um they were less mythological and more intellectual. So you get kind of a nice balance if you study both of these side by side to understand like what is the divine mind? What is the divine will? You know, these kind of terms we sort of throw around here and there. Like, anyway, um, yeah, this stuff is really fun to study and contemplate. And I think it's really important to study and contemplate it uh, for yeah. most of us at least. Yeah, especially, especially if you like this aspect of this philosophical aspect to the whole picture about Yotish and the Vedic context, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, let's just go, let's just skip to the next chapter then, right? Cause that's, yeah, let's start. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> so now we get great incarnations of the Lord, of Vishnu. This the, is very interesting chapter. Yeah, the avatars and so on. Um, so who are, the, who are the incarnations of Vishnu? Um, endowed with Jivamsha. And, you know, this is something I guess we'll have to explain, but O Brahman, the four incarnations vis-a-vis -vis Ramakrishna, Narasimha, and Varaha are Hwali with Param Atamsha. Paramatamsha. Paramatamsha, thank you. The other incarnations have in them Jivamsha Amsha too. So basically this is saying that there are... Um, there are like something like nine, nine incarnations of Vishnu. The tenth is supposed to be the Kalki avatar, yet yet to come. But I actually think he's already come. Uh, but that's that's for another time. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, the idea is that the Paramatman is um, the the Paramatman is just another is is like another name for. It's just another way to say Brahman, really. Like Paramatman is like the supreme soul. Yeah. So the idea is like these four say these four avatars listed here are like totally an emanation of the supreme spirit. It's just God. It's himself. Yeah, it's just no, God. No, no blemishes, no contaminations. Just it's it's like the idea. Jivatma would be like the drop from the ocean, and Paramatma would be like the whole ocean. The itself. The ocean itself. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, so in a sense, like these beings don't really exist because they don't have a soul. They don't have an individualized soul. They're a pure emanation of the Supreme. They are the totality of the Supreme God. Yeah. It's yeah. like God himself. It's, it's not even Jesus Christ. It's, it's like God. It, yeah, it, no, no. Jesus Christ. Pe Jesus Christ would be. People have misunderstood. Mass? No, because he's no. the son. And no, Jesus is actually a no, human right? life. Jesus is a human live stream, but that's another that's another video for another. No, time. no, but you know, let's uh, we're taking into consideration the idea that he's the son of God. He would be uh, in in terms of this relationship, he would be like uh, J Jivamsha, right? Or he, would he be a? He's not avatar? this. He's not this kind of avatar. No, no, but let's let's just presuppose. I mean, if he if he, if he would he be a Jivamsha or would yeah. he be a Paramatmansha? He would be a Jivamsha. Uh, Jivamsha, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so the, uh, the idea is these other incarnations of Vishnu are Jivamsha, meaning that they have like an individualized soul pattern or soul self, so to speak, that uh, sort of makes them less 
illimitable, I guess, is the idea. I don't really fully understand this. I don't even know if how accurate this is, to be honest. Like, I, I really don't. Like, I don't know if well, stuff this, like this... Well, this is, this is a religious text, so we're just, you know... Yeah, but I'm, what I'm saying is, like, I don't know if this same view is in the Puranas and the Upanishads. Well, probably the there's are different perspectives. As you I don't know. know. So Vedic we have to take it with a grain of salt. But yeah. the idea here is that uh, of the nine incarnations, you know, uh, uh, Rama, Krishna. Uh, wait, wait, go, go up. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, I I could still see it, so I maybe, uh, it, maybe it looks different for you. It it says uh uh where, where are the Rama for incarnation? Rama, Rama Krishna, Krishna, Narashima, and Baraha are like pure God. Yeah. And the others are God with a little bit of Jivatma. So they're God, but they have like some aspects of humanity to them. Yeah. That would be, it, it's just like a hierarchical thing in terms of the incarnations of the avatars. Uh, some are purer than others, but the ones that are not as pure are still way more pure than, than the normal human being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, why is this in, why is this important? Like in this astrology text? Well, well, it's for, a I think for an, another, a number of reasons. Yeah. It's a religious thing. And also he's going to tie these, um, these avatars to the nine grahas. Yeah. And he, and, so we interesting. Have, and we have them here. I, I don't know if you want to read the, the text where he goes on to, to, to mention them. Yeah, uh, sure. Right, right here, five to seven. Can you see it? Yeah, he says, uh, from the sun god, the incarnation of Rama, from the moon, that of Krishna, from Mars, that of Narashima, from Mercury, that of Buddha, from Jupiter, that of Bama, ba, ba, Bamana, Bamana, from yeah. Venus, that of Paras, Parasurama, mm -hmm. uh, from Saturn, that of Kurma, Kurma, from Rahu, the Baraha, and from Ketu, that of Mina, not Pisces, but Mina, the fish. All other yeah. incarnations that uh, than these also are through the grahas. The beings with more paramatmansha are called divine beings. So in a way, he's just saying how the different incarnations relate to the different planets. And, you know, I have them here. I don't know if we want to go one by one, but it's basically, you know, the sun is Rama, who is the yeah. seventh in who is the seventh incarnation of, of Vishnu. Uh, the moon is Krishna, which is the eighth incarnation of Vishnu. Uh, we, we read from Rama in the Ramayama. We read from Krishna in the Mahabharata. Yeah. And Arashima is the fourth incarnation. He's the lion. He's from Mars. He's the guy that destroyed the evil king yeah. in the form of a lion. Uh, then we have Buddha, which is the ninth incarnation of, of Vishnu. And we're going to talk about this later on because there's a certain thing I want to mention here, uh, which would be Mercury, which is Buddha, the enlightened one. Yeah. Then you have Jupiter, which would be Vamana, the fifth incarnation of Krishna, uh, of Krishna, look at me, of Vishnu, who is basically the midget. What's the bad word in English? Midget or dwarf? No, isn't he, a, isn't he the child that steps on... Yeah, that? well, he's a midget. Oh, he is? Okay. But what's the bad word? Midget or dwarf? I guess I midget. Always... Midget is the... Dwarf. Kind of... Then it's a dwarf. Sorry to the little people out there. So um, then we have uh, Venus, who's the sixth incarnation. As you can see, the order of the incarnations are not the order of the planets. Yeah. Parashumara, which is basically the sixth incarnation, Venus. And basically, this was the Brahman that became a Kshatriya with the yeah. axe. And he teaches, uh, he actually taught Bhishma, who was nice. the Didn't know that. grandsire of the Pandava and Kaurava brothers in the nice. yeah, Kurukshetra. Then uh, you go to the last ones, and these are the oldest ones of, of Vishnu. You have Kurma for Saturn, which is the second incarnation of, of um, Vishnu, which is yeah. the tortoise. Then you have Baraha for Rahu, which is the third incarnation, which is the boar. And then you have Ketu, which was the first one, which was Mina, uh, which was the, the fish. fish yeah. So I just want to mention something here, which is quite interesting in relation to the dating of the text. Mm -hmm. You know, there are several red flags here. Well, there's a big one. And, and this is something that is discussed in India. You know, sometimes in India, the avatars change in terms of North India and South India. Because he mentions Buddha 
as the incarnation of Mercury, right? Yeah. Which would be the ninth incarnation before Kalki. But what happens here? When did Buddha live? He lived in the 7th century AD. I'm sorry, 7th century BC. I'm BC. Sorry. Yeah, BC. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. 7th century uh, BC. So what's going on here? You know, if Brihad Parashara Hora Shastra is really from 3000 BC, then how do they know about Buddha in, right. you know, in the 7th century BC, 2300 years afterwards, it, after it was written, right? Right, but do do we even know for sure if like they're talking about Siddhartha Gautama Buddha? That's something that is being uh, that has been debated, and I'm going to explain it. You know, yeah, as you know, I, Buddha was was more uh, given. He he was more. Uh, he he. I don't know if he lived, but but he was more given to be in the north of India, in the Himalayas, okay. than in the south. So you know, in the north, he is. Um, the version of Mercury, but in South India, uh, it changes. In South India, Krishna is the incarnation of Mercury, and Balarama, which was, I think, the, the cousin or the brother of Krishna, is the moon. So, okay. you know, you, you kind of get that. And, and this, is, this is something that's very interesting because, as you know, Buddha was not necessarily... Uh, traditionally Vedic. He was from a Vedic background, but he became basically a rebel yeah. founding, you know, Buddhism, which was basically a religion that is closely associated to, to Vedic uh, thought, but it's not, you know, it's, yeah. it's something Well, I and, don't think, I don't think he founded Buddhism. I think people well, yeah, yeah, created yeah, Buddhism yeah, after him. Afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> okay. definitely. And, and, and it's very interesting because Parashara tries to associate this concept to the planets but there's a problem, and you mentioned it, that it's not the Nava Avatara, it's the Dasha Avatara. What happens to Kalki here? Why isn't he here? Right? And that's something that I've right. always asked myself. Uh, could Kalki be Uranus? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's something very interesting that well, always Kalki has been left out of this equation. I don't know what you think about well, it. Well, Uranus is supposedly visible by the naked eye at certain points during exactly. the year. I've never seen it, but like, this is what I understand. And so it's very possible that there were people that knew of this planet, but maybe just a very few, or they didn't really talk about it. I think in the mystery schools, they knew a lot more than was written down in many texts. Yeah, but very that's true. Maybe a romanticism, who knows? Anyway. You know, you, you ha we have to say that there is no historical text that we know of. I mean, traditionally, academically yeah. speaking, that um, give uh, evidence to the existence of Uranus Neptune before, you know, Herschel and the 19th century with Neptune. However, and this is very interesting, some people say that Galileo discovered Uranus but confused it with one of the moons of Jupiter. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, well, apparently the moons of Jupiter, on a side note, would, would be visible if Jupiter wasn't so bright in the sky. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's how big Jupiter's moons are. So yeah. I could understand him making that, that error. That's so interesting. Um, but yeah, um, why don't we, yeah, why don't we move on? Oh, we, sure, sure. You know, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, then he, he goes on to just say down here that like the uh, the grahas, which are the names the, the name for planets in Jyotish, which basically means that which seizes one's consciousness, right? Like to seize is associated basically. Um, that basically like he's saying that the grahas are innately paramatamsha, and that the jivatma portions from the grahas take birth as human beings and live their lives. So it's kind of this this idea that I've found in other teachings on occultism um like hp blavatsky talks about it as well that like each person is sort of like they are each soul group is like associated to a planet one of these like seven well seven planets and i mean in this they might say nine but sometimes they they do more with the seven like in the like in jaimini sutras for example like it's really more you know the seven that'll be one of the seven will be the um, Atma Kadrika, for example, although that's some people debate that. So I don't want to 
quash that. But, but the idea is very, is very ancient that like you, you're, you have this like soul group that you're a part of for lack of a better term, and that they can be linked with a planet. And we do see this in the technique of the Atmakarika, which we'll talk about at a much later time in more depth. And we also see it in like Hellenistic astrology with this concept of the Oko Despotes, which is basically the, the master of the chart. You know, you find this one planet that is supposed to symbolize like the dominant quality of the soul in the person. And so astrologers have always been interested in this notion of planetary soul relationships. So I just think that's interesting. Definitely. Okay, cool. Chapter three, planetary characters and descriptions. So Man, I just want to say this is a <laughs> chapter of supreme importance. This chapter it's very useful, is, yeah. is caviar. This, this <laughs> chapter is, is really I mean, this chapter well, is amazing. it's caviar. Yeah, I can see what you mean. I, I would think of it as like bread and butter too, right? It's like this stuff can really sustain you. And but yes, it's caviar in the sense that it's like the creme de la creme. Of, it's it's the yeah. nitty gritty. I mean, this sure. is like like you are like mining and suddenly you find a diamond. This is like yeah. Is, here we he, we have descriptions of the planets. And what makes the planets the planets? What makes Mars Mars? What makes Sun the Sun? And so on. And right. So, on. so yeah, it's a pretty extensive chapter. Uh, how did you want to tackle it? Well, first of all, I just wrote down that you know in the beginning of the chapter, specifically. Um, let me see my book. Uh, specifically in uh, Shloka, um, you know, right from the from the bat. I mean, we start uh, with. Uh, the shloka two uh, shloka four six four six. Okay, cool. There it is. Six, yeah. You know, this is very interesting. We are starting with the nakshatras. Um, we discussed before we discussed Parashara, We discussed Yavanayataka, and something that we found in Yavanayataka, which is a text that supposedly came before Parashara. Uh, nakshatras are discussed at the very end of the text yeah and you know, very just very like like very barely discussed like and not like, only that it kind of seems something that was introduced into the text it, i mean we don't know it could be absolutely it could be. but yeah. here in parashara we start off with the nakshatras the asterisms and as we've discussed in other places you know nakshatras are not necessarily something uh, pertaining to horoscopic astrology necessarily. It's more of a time device and it's yeah. more of a muhurta device for electional astrology. Uh, and, and, you know, he talks about the nakshatras and it's very interesting because the versions of Brihat Parashara Horoshastra that I've seen in this part, you know, the, the 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 way he discusses nakshatras yeah. you know the commentary on the shloka is usually <laughs> much bigger than what he says about the nakshatras and basically we have no mention of ayanamsha which is something that's very interesting that i want to yeah. mention you yeah. know we have no mention of ayanamsha we have no mention uh, that uh, ashwini and Aries are aligned. We have no mention of Gandanta points. Well, I mean, let's see. Like the Seb Zodiac. Oh, we can read. We can read. Yeah. Comprises read. of 27 asterisms commencing from Ashwini. The same area is divided in 12 parts equal to 12 Rashis or signs commencing from Aries. So it's kind of vague. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that like the more. Should, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, like, the more I do uh, astrology and, and experiment with things, the more I have found it easier to use the nakshatras in interpretation if they are aligned with the zodiac, like most Jyotishis do it. So Ashwini beginning from zero Aries. Now, I am also of a uniquely unique disposition or unique perspective that because I've studied both, you know, tropical and sidereal, that... If you're going to use tropical, you can use tropical lunar oh, sure. mantra. And that's Definitely. what the great, the great sage Ibn Arabi did, actually, and advocated. He was a Sufi mystic and astrologer and much more. And then you can also do, in sidereal, use the 12-sign Rashis and, the, and, the, you know, and so on. 
So I, because I, I experimented with, you know, what a lot of people are doing today. And I know that you either do it or that's like, you've experimented with it or, but I think you, that's pretty much what you practice for, uh, you know, correct me. I don't, I don't use the chatteras really. I, I, in horoscopic astrology, I just don't. Okay. But you use them, you use them to get like the dishas, right? Obviously because they're so, so other Anyway, yeah. the idea that like, you know, the nakshatras should be sidereal and the, and the zodiac should be tropical or whatever is yeah. as a new idea. It's very interesting. And I found that I was never able to get my mind to really focus and synthesize the information. Recently, now that I've switched to integrating them, uh, like most most Indian astrologers do, I find it a lot easier. So I'm not saying one is wrong and one is right. I'm just saying that you have to kind of find what works for you. And definitely um, these texts are, they're open for interpretation in a lot of respects. Yeah. So. But I want to, I just want to say that Parashara does not mention Ayanamsha. And right. that's something that, that we have to take into consideration, you know, there is a place where, where nakshatras and rashis coexist and they can coexist. But the idea of Ayanamshi is just not mentioned here. And, and just yeah. look at the, at the commentary Santanam gives for this uh, shloka. Yeah. And um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that. And cool. after, after the nakshatras, we start with the nitty gritty. We start really with, with everything that really is very basic in astrology, which is basically, yeah. you know, we go with the names, we go with malefic benefits, we yeah. go with governance. You know, the cabinet for me is just one of the most amazing analogies to understand the planets. Right. Uh, and and we find we find both of these things in Yavana Jataka, interestingly enough, like exactly as they are here, I believe. Uh you know, like in Yavana Jataka, yeah, as far as I remember, it says the exact same things about these these planets for the governances, right? The sun is soul, moon is mind, and so on. And then the planetary cabinet too, you know, sun and moon are royalty, Mars army chief, and so on and so forth. Except it doesn't have Rahu and Ketu because exactly. they're not in Yavana Jataka at all. That's exactly what I wanted. This is and an interesting notion that Rahu and Ketu form the planetary army. It's, it's replete with a lot of stuff that you can use when doing a reading, like symbolism, you know? And... And that's something I wanted to also say. For the first time, we read the nodes. I mean, for the first time in this book, we are, I mean, yeah, we, we read about American. them with the incarnations, but, but right. now we're being, it's be, they're being described. And as we mentioned before, in Javana Yataka, we get basically, uh, did, did we, did we there, there was no mention of the nodes in Javana Yataka no, at all. not at all. Not so at all. bizarre. Yeah, and in Brihat Parashara Horashastra, a text that was written maybe if we use the chronology as as we kind of know, maybe it was written um, like five hundred uh, years 500 later. Years later, and we are getting descriptions of the notes. And and by the way, Parashara is and and Vedic astrology uh, is probably the school of astrology that most uh, gives descriptions to the notes. You know, and, yeah. and and we're going to see that he mentions the notes, but at the same time, we're going to see that he seldom associates the notes with uh, past lives, future lives, like like most of the oh, yeah. astrologers He do. really doesn't at all, as far as I can see, but I could have missed something, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and, and then he talks about the deities. Which yeah, basically right here. Do you want to talk about that or, or? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to mention it's very interesting that he doesn't give deities to the nodes. Um, whereas Jaimini, which is a text that I do believe is far older than this one, does give deities mm. to the nodes. He calls uh, Rahu as relating to um, Durga. Durga, yeah. And he, and he gives Ketu to uh, Ganapati. Ganapati, Ganesha. Yeah, yeah Ganesha. So... Um, the other, the other ones he gives, uh, are different from this too. I mean, these are very useful. Don't get me wrong. It's just that since studying Jaimini, I tend to prefer Jaimini's distribution of the deities because, you know, he gives fire Agni, whereas many other texts, including Jaimini, give Shiva to the Shiva. Sun. Yeah. This is to the sun for those who don't know, because he's following the Navagraha scheme. 
given earlier. So when he gives these lists, you have to memorize that scheme and know know what it is, right? Like Brahma will refer to Saturn because it's the seventh in the Naha Graha scheme. And so, yeah, water or Varuna. And it's funny because Varuna was not originally a water deity, actually, in the Vedas. Um, it's a more it's a modern so, it's a more modern thing. Developed. Yeah. So we have we do have, in my opinion, something much more modern, something kind of cobbled together in this particular sutra. This to me is not. I don't. I mean, Agni is the sun. Of course, that makes sense. But so does like Surya Deva and uh, you know uh, Savitri and you know even several other deities can be associated with the sun, not just Agni. So. You know, we have to we have to take this all with a grain of salt, and this is why it's good to compare texts. Uh, what did you want to say about the deities? Um, I just wanted to say uh, that, uh, well, not not really. I didn't. I really didn't want to talk a lot a lot about them. I didn't write anything specifically other okay. than you know, there's the idea of of Graha Shanti. You know, these are the deities that you might want to uh, pray to. In addition to those of Jamie, of course, the Jamie deities are more of a 12 house thing. But uh, these are the, the deities yeah. you want to pray to if you have some problems in your life. Yeah, and that I think will work very well. Like if you have major Saturn problems, like you can propitiate Brahma. And it's funny because people don't really propitiate Brahma much in India. But I actually did read once there are still temples to Brahma in other parts of Asia. Oh, in other parts of Asia, okay. Yeah, wow. straight up like off the coast of India or kind of in like these areas. Like for whatever reason, Brahma was was kind of, his temples were phased out in most Indian culture, but there are temples to him in other areas in Asia, kind of near what, India. Yeah. What came first, the chicken, the egg, or Brahma? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, Brahma is, yeah, well, there's a lot of different mythologies about Brahma, but yeah, there is an egg, right? There's the, here in Yagarbha, so you know, there you is know, the egg, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I just want to say before we skip the part that's the complexions and, and the colors, uh, okay. which was the shloka before that which, oh okay yeah we did yeah which is basically uh 16 17 you know in this chat and this is a very interesting one because a lot of yotishis associate this part with color right and and let's let's be uh, clear here there's a lot of discrepancies with a lot of classics in relation to color uh there are a couple of of, of things that, that are usually you know they stick uh, uh, for example, that Mars is red, obviously, uh, that uh, the moon is white and Venus is white. But then the, the colors uh, are more associated with Rashis. And then you have a lot of other versions. So, you yeah. know, in other classics, you have different versions related to the Rashis in relation to colors and not necessarily to planets. And, you know, Ernst uh, said that this is basically more of an allusion to the color of the skin of races in the world more than, you know, color per se. Because, you know, you have the usual color schemes for the planets, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, like, yeah, we, we, all, we all know yeah. those people that whose skin are blood red and whose uh, skin is green grass, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, the problem is that, that it's, thing of, uh, it's a thing of translation, right? Yeah, of course. The idea that, that when when you read ancient texts, it's very difficult to translate colors because there's no way to know what, I mean, how do we know purple is purple? How do we know right. red is red? I mean, it's really difficult. Yeah, I and I, I don't even, to be honest, I don't even pay attention to stuff like this. I just, I, I do a little bit, but I do things a bit differently that in the way that makes sense to me. And you know, these, these things are, yeah, these yeah. things are more for prashnas than anything else, in my opinion. You know, they like, are, yeah. But yeah. even in even in prashna, like you know, you, I don't know, you know, there, like you said, there are different schemes for the colors of the planets and the signs. There are many different schemes across the various traditions. You gotta like pick what makes the most sense to you. You know, like moon as white and silver makes sense to me because you look at it in the sky and like, duh, you know, no brainer. Right, but Jupiter has been ascribed to purple by some Hellenistic authors, uh, because purple is a very high vibrational color, like Jupiter. 
So that makes sense, right? Ultraviolet, yeah. But then Venus has also been ascribed to purple by some Hellenistic texts because it talks about Venus as like the royal purple of royalty. Purple was a royal color. And you have an artist like Prince who has, you know, uh, Venus in Taurus in the seventh house and in like an angle from Fortune. Anyway, I'm getting off topic, but he's a very powerful Venus and purple rain and all his purple stuff, you know? I mean... He's like a modern royal wearing purple. Yeah, Col- so, color associations are tricky. They're yeah. tricky, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, then I just wanted to go to the sex part, which is very interesting, uh, oh. which is uh, 19, Shloka 19. Yeah. You know, in, 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 in Hellenistic astrology, Saturn is usually it's, related to male, but yeah. here we have a, a balance of Mercury and Saturn being neuter. Yeah, um, Moon and Venus being female, obviously, and Sun and, and Mars. And being again, female. this is straight from Yavana Jataka as well. We found the same thing there. And I personally think this works really well in practice. Excellent. And then, you know, we, we talk about um, the elements or Bhutas, then the castes, which is obviously, yeah. which is also a good thing to use, the Gunas. And then we start talking about the description of the planets and, and Parashur describes them as, as people. Very yeah. nice descriptions you know these are these are very deep you know uh, i wish i could i could uh read more fluently sanskrit in order to get the the, the originals but these are great sure. descriptions in terms of what the planets are yeah definitely and, and in shloka 30 okay shloka oh i love this i love this so much thank you for bringing this up <laughs> we have a description of rahu and Kedu. and man this is this is weird. I mean, we it's don't really weird <laughs> because you usually don't get, uh, you know, Hellenistic astrologers don't talk a lot about these specifics of nodes. I mean, they mention them, uh, but they don't go so deep into them like they do here in Yodish. And I just wanted to read it. It says Rahu has smoky appearance with a blue mixed physique. He resides in forests and is horrible. <laughs> He's windy in temperament and is intelligent. Ketu is akin to Rahu. And I just want to say that there is no mention of past lives, future lives. No. There is no mention of draconian astrology here. I I love this, though. I just love this line. He resides in forests and is horrible. I just, I crack up when I read that. I don't know why. It's just like the, maybe it's the translation of it, you know? It's just... He's like a Bigfoot, yeah. Yeah, I love how, like, matter-of-fact it is. He resides in forests and is horrible. And it's like, there's no explanation as to why he's horrible, but he just is. Yeah, that's (laughs) why we need to learn Sanskrit. That's the problem. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, this is a good shloka. Yeah, primary ingredients or sapta datus. Oh, yes, for, Ayurveda. for, yes, um, for medical astrology, yeah. I have a bit of a problem with it because I've always related bones to Saturn. So I have a hard time uh, knowing how to use this at the moment, but maybe eventually it'll make more sense to me. Oh, and not only that, th- there, there's a discrepancy also in, in Ayurveda because sometimes there's confusion between Mars and Saturn. Uh, because sometimes okay. people say Mars is muscles and ligaments, and other that people makes say, sense. but other people say it's Saturn. Right, and that's the what they're saying here, I guess. So Saturn is muscles, and then Mars is marrow here, which yeah. is interesting. I don't know. I that, that doesn't quite work for me, but I'm not a, an experienced Ayurvedic practitioner. Me neither. Maybe if I was, this would make more sense. I. Like I said, I take Saturn's as, as bones, and so do many other astrolo- astrology texts and whatnot. Um, and, you know, some of these other ones make sense, like uh, semen for Venus. That was oh, mentioned definitely. earlier. Um, I, you know, I would give I would give and, fat to the moon and blood to Jupiter myself. But Oh, no, but fat with Jupiter makes sense. Yeah, fat, no, I shouldn't say that. Fat with Jupiter does make sense because yeah. Jupiter's so expansive and buoyant um yeah anyway and, and some people say that mercury uh is like the the electrical the the yeah the, the um, electrical impulses in the body instead of skin i mean it is uh, yeah it's the um the nervous system the central yeah, nervous, the nervous system. system but here it says skin i mean 
I, there, there's a lot that we can be discussed about this. Yeah, I think this is, I don't think this is meant to be like a, a final say on the matter. I think it's just the idea that you have this Sapta Datus in Ayurveda and it's a very important key principle Definitely. in understanding the body. So that's why, but you know, in any sort of medical system of astrology, you'll find that like, okay, Jupiter rules fat, but he also rules the liver, right? He also rules the lungs. He also rules like uh, sometimes the blood and so on. Like, you know, it's like each planet has multiple different things they rule over. So, um, okay. Anyway, yeah, moving on. We then get the, we, we see the abodes. Yeah. Then we talk about periods like in Mukurtas, which is very, yeah, those abodes are excellent, you know, yeah. and, and for, for figuring out dignity, they're really good. Uh, then you have a periods in Mukurta, which is basically uh, for electional astrology. Then we talk about tastes, and there's there's a little uh, also another debate with taste, because okay. uh, sometimes people uh, mix uh, the tastes of Mars and Sun. You know, some people say that, yeah. for example, here Sun is pungent and Mars is bitter, but other people say that. No, sun is bitter and Mars is pungent. So okay. you know, there, there's another thing here, which is a particularity that, you know, we have to mention. And then, you know, we move on to Dik Bala. Yes. And, and, you know, here, believe it or not, there's a reference to sect. In okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, right this, is a very, this is a very important shloga because we're getting like the basic pillars uh, on which we're going to build the, the next things that we're going to be discussing in this book in terms of, of how planets work and, and how the strength is, is measured. Yeah. And, and real quick, before we go and talk about this, I want to yeah. mention that this is, it's very interesting because these shlokas are clearly a mixture of um, Sapta Graha scheme and Navagraha scheme, where you're seeing that in a lot of the shlokas, Rahu and Ketu are not mentioned. Rahu Definitely. And Ketu don't Definitely. Rule a Datu, they don't rule a, a place, they don't rule a, you know, but then other shlokas where they're in there. So this is clearly like a a mixture of traditions. It's It's almost like I have a feeling that maybe not when this was written, but maybe, right, or around the time there was people innovating and adding the Rahu Ketu stuff in. And so this is kind of a mixture of two traditions, one, a collage. Old, one yeah. emerging. It's very fascinating. And we do see that Jyotish did far more with the nodes than Hellenistic astrology did, far more. And I think that is one of the great strengths of Jyotish and how it developed. And and we let's talk about the sect reference that many people usually don't talk about. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Uh, so uh, it's dig dig bala, which again we do find in Yavana Jataka. It's not called dig bala there, and I don't think it's called that here yet. It's called that later. But it's this idea that the planets have more strength, more accidental dignity, one might say, in certain directions. So Sun and Mars when they're closer to the midheaven, because that's the southmost point. Uh, north of the equator at least right and so 10th house midheaven and so on and i think everybody knows this so i'm gonna gloss over it um but then yeah it says like strong during the night our moon mars and saturn right while well, mercury can be either and then the rest are strong during the day this mixes up the hellenistic doctrine of sect which is which is far more ancient and what we find in Yavana Jataka is we find the Hellenistic doctrine of sect but here they have switched Saturn with with Mar uh with with Venus in these schemes yeah and they I have think switch Saturn and Venus it has to do with the traditional idea in Yotish that Saturn and Sun are bitter 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 enemies it may indeed, yeah, that that would make sense, and that's, also that's the only hypothesis I can think. I I also think it has to do with this idea that okay, so you have moon and you have sun, and you can't change those, right? So they yeah. put the benefics during the day, and they put the malefics during the night. Nice, that's a nice one. You're yeah, nice. Okay, yeah, cool. I'm glad you agree that that's a possibility. Yeah, so I don't I don't think this is wrong. I think this is. This is just another perspective, but I, I don't know. I, I guess I just prefer the traditional Hellenistic version myself, but 
This is not something I've ever really heard too many people talk about, as you said. And, and you know, sect also has, in Hellenistic astrology, has, has its problems specifically with Mars and, you know, the rejoicing factors for it. A lot of people don't agree with everything with Mars, but sure, I, this is really weird because usually people don't talk about this this people don't talk about how it's tr because in Yavana Yataka, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, the same scheme as in Hellenistic astrology, correct? Yeah, exactly the same. And that scheme of sect, historically speaking, would uh, predate uh, Parashara and at the same time would predate Yavana Yataka. Yavana Yataka yeah. copied it from Hellenistic astrology and Parashara kind of copied it from Yavana Yataka or maybe got it mixed up. I don't know. But, you know. Right. That's something that is very important to, to say, you know, once again, um, this is like a type of evidence maybe to, to, to back up the idea that, you know, Hellenistic astrology was very um, uh, in Yotish already. It was, it was there and, and it was mixed up with the autochthonous, the, na the native uh, astrology of India. Yeah. So moving on then we see the relation of the planets to plants and trees nice the relation of the planets to clothes the relation to the planets to seasons oh i like the cast stuff here because it includes rahu oh, and k2 it's it's amazing yeah rahu and k2 rahu rules the outcast while k2 governs mixed cast so that's interesting just as a side note yeah oh yes that's that's the last last part right did we yeah yeah and and yeah. and then we talk about the datu mula jiva scheme uh yeah. which is something that a lot of people have interpreted in many different ways mm -hmm. yeah and, and again a lot of this stuff comes from yavana jataka as we saw yeah. when we did the videos and then we start with dignity uh, exaltation debilitation uh we should go there to see the differences between the exaltations and debilitations of Yotish and, and Vedic astrology Sure. We are in shloka. I'm going to tell you what shloka we are. 49 through 50? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we get the exact same exaltation scheme that everyone knows and loves in Hellenistic and medieval Persian astrology and stuff, right? It's exactly the same, so that's cool. But then we get this weird thing that we don't see this in Yavana Jataka, but we did see it in... Um, we, we saw, okay, so we saw Mula Trikona in Yavana Jataka, but we didn't see this idea that like right after the first three degrees of exaltation portion in Taurus, the moon is, becomes in Taurus in Mula Trikona and so on with the rest of the planets. There's like these like, these like segments where they're in Mula Trikona in that sign, but then they're not in Mula Trikona in that sign if they're not in those segments. We didn't see that in Yavana Jataka, you know? Um, not that I remembered. We just saw like these are the Mula Tricona signs or, or whatever. And at the same time, you know, Mula Tricona is something that exists in Yotish only. And it is something that is seldom explained. Like well, it's all why... the masculine, it's all the masculine signs with the exception of the moon. I mean, I've heard explanations, but they're like from Yotishis. Yeah. Like, for example, the idea that you start from where Mula is in Sagittarius and then oh you God. take the trines, right? What happened? Are you okay? No, no, I'm just like, I'm listening to you. I'm like, oh, oh, my God. oh, oh. you this take Mula where he is in Sagittarius intense. and then you take the trines, which would be obviously um, Sagittarius, Aries, and Leo. And there you have the Mula Triconas of Jupiter, which would be one to 10 degrees or one to 15 i'm sorry i, I don't know um uh, what, one the first one third of sass yeah, so the one, first 10. one to ten. Yeah. one to ten then you have one to 12 aries for mars and then you have one to 20 if i'm not mistaken for or one okay. to ten for sun in leo and then and then what you do is you take the upachayas from mula in sagittarius for the rest of them which would be the third the sixth, okay. uh, the eleventh, and the tenth. The third would be Sagittarius, uh, uh, Aquarius, which would be Saturn, and Saturn gets Mula Tricona there, just as the Sun. Which, once again, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's, it's, um... uh, after uh, where's where's the Sun? Uh, sun is is, is I can't find it. Oh, uh, first twenty degrees of Sun. Twenty degrees. So zero to twenty is Saturn in Aquarius. Okay, so the then opposite. you go. Yeah, 
and then you go to the sixth house from Sagittarius where Mula Nakshatra is, and then you fall into Taurus, and there you have the Mula Tricona from 3 to 30 for the moon. Then you go to the 10th house from Sagittarius, which would be a, a Virgo, where you have the Mula Tricona of Mercury uh, between 15 and 20. Okay. And then you go to the 11th, which is the last Tupachaya for Libra, where you get the Mula Tricona of Venus from 0 to 15. And that's the explanation. I, I know that's the explanation most people use. Okay. Uh, I'm, but, just, I mean, I'm just going to say that makes utterly no sense to me. And it's much easier... Yeah to say that basically all of the masculine domiciles of the planets are the Mulitriconas because they're masculine. And then not the necessarily moon, the moon because is the one exception, Taurus. And, and Mercury. And Mercury, yeah. And Mercury and Moon are the exceptions, sure. Um, I don't know, like, man. Like, I, and, and, they, and they usually are very accept. But that's the explanation. And, and you know, but, but at the same time, you have I that explanation. That. But why Mars is it from zero to 12? Yeah, Why? that's that's where it it really loses. Yeah, me. yeah. So. But it's it's very interesting because the this is the second best dignity for um for planets. And you yeah. know, we should we should discuss the differences and degrees in the exaltations. Oh yeah, okay, sure. I um and I just want to put it out there that like I loosely use Mula Tricona, but I don't really give a lot of importance to it. Yeah, nobody knows why Mula Tricona exists. Yeah. However, there's, a, there's an explanation for exaltations, but let, let's see the exaltations. I mean, I have an explanation for exaltations. Oh, let's do it. Let's kind do of it. complicated, but uh, well, it's not that complicated. Anyway, um, the exaltation degrees are, again, slightly different from Hellenistic. And I think we saw this same change in Yavana Jataka, where like instead of 10 or sorry, in Hellenistic, it's not 10 Aries for the sun, it's 19. It's not fifth, it's not, uh, oh, I don't remember. I have uh, them here. Uh, for the moon is three Taurus, for sun is 19 Aries, for Mercury is 15 Virgo. Yeah, okay. This is 27 Pisces, for Mars is 28 Capricorn, for Jupiter is 15 Cancer, and for Saturn is 21 Libra. So we see that the, the, the differentiations are the sun, the Jupiter and Saturn, which very interestingly are the day sect. Yeah, okay. And they change the sect here and they change the exaltation degrees. I don't know, that's that's an idea. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I think it was just like a translation a typo, maybe. error that got perpetuated. But, you know, some people swear by this and think it's like the most profound thing in the universe. I don't really use exaltation degrees. They don't really make any sense to me, but I do believe in exaltations and my my analysis of them comes from the the tropical zodiac and the cycle of light and darkness throughout the year and that is basically that like you have sun in the spring equinox when the light is balanced but beginning to increase spring equinox is also when the the sun is metaphorically rising over the celestial equator so it's like a sunrise opposite that you have saturn which is the lord of darkness right so when the white light is waning, beginning to wane after the autumnal equinox and so on, the sun is metaphorically setting over the, the, the equator, uh, celestial equator. And then, you know, moon is in the second from the sun, which just like for exaltations, which just mirrors the same thing in their domiciles. Um, Venus becomes the dawn bringer in Pisces next to the sun in Aries. She's heralding the dawn. Lucifer. Yeah. Jupiter is in Cancer um, as like an expansive, like showing how like the, that's the hottest time of the year, summer solstice. He's in lightest time. Jupiter is heat and expansion and stuff like that. Opposing him becomes Mars, which is like the sort of the, you know, the, the wintry sign Capricorn. It has both malefics dignified there. It's the most difficult period of the year. And then Mercury is just kind of opposite Venus for a few other reasons that I just don't feel like getting into because it's it's very speculative. But interestingly enough, all of the night sect planets are in a sex their 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 exaltation sign is in a sextal to one of their domiciles, and all of the day 
diurnal planets, they're in a trine to one of their domiciles, and then Mercury is in a square to his other domicile. So nice. that's not a coincidence. Definitely nice. not. So there's some things, yeah. You know, and, and, and in Chris Brennan's book of, you know, Hellenistic Astrology, he cites uh, the reason for these degrees from Cyril Fagan, which was a, a sidereal-ist uh, Western astrologer, who says that these positions extrapolate from the positions that happen more or less in the late 8th century BC, specifically 786 okay. BC, uh, that the, were the positions that were in the sky when a temple was built to honor Nabu, which is basically the god of scribes in the Babylonian tradition, okay. and it, who is closely associated to Mercury in modern times. And it's the idea that these positions came out of that building of that uh, hmm. of that temple, which wow. can also relate to the explanations you gave. The problem is that wow. the positions per se are astronomically impossible. Oh, okay. Oops. Happen at the same time because of the exaltation of Venus and Mercury. Wow. Right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Venus that's and true. Mercury, I'm sorry. You. I can't hear you. Are you? Are you? Oh, can, can you hear me you? now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. Yeah, right, because Mercury couldn't be that far away from the sun, so. Yeah. So, so usually, in theory, you could have at least six of these uh, positions in a chart. And wow, would, yeah. Not, not, not taking into consideration other factors that might cancel them out from the Yotish perspective. But yeah. Obviously, you know, and, and for people to know, you know, I, 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 there, there's got to be a mathematical way to figure out when these positions are going to happen. Um, I don't know when they are going to happen specifically, but it's, 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 it's an interesting investigation. But yeah, th those are the exaltations and mulatriconas. And, you know, we're just talking about them because it's, it's very important to know where they come from and everything. Yeah, so, I think so, too. Yeah. And you, everyone has to decide for themselves how they want to use them and if they want to use them. But and, and at the um, same time, and we didn't you know, mention this before. I'm sorry. Yes. No, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. And we didn't mention this before we, when we talked about Digbala, you know, in Jyotish, you know, the Sun and Mars in the 10th are good, Jupiter and Mercury in the 1st are good, Venus and, and, and Moon are good, uh, and the Saturn yeah. and the 4th, I'm sorry, and Saturn in the 7th is good. And that the 1st from the, um, the positions where in Hellenistic astrology they are uh, happy, right? Uh, the joys, the same, yeah, the yeah, joys. And at the same time, these precepts also kind of contradict other Yotish principles like Karkabab Nashe, where, okay, the moon has directional strength in the fourth, but the moon in the fourth, being the Karka of the fourth house, also destroys the fourth. So you, you see, there's a lot of things that might not yeah. go together sometimes. You know, this, these are things well, that it's nice to know, nice to differentiate, and to have in mind that, no, not everything is going to fit perfectly. But, you know, right. the things that do good for you. Well, and when we talk about the chapter on, when we, when we end up doing a video on um, um, Shadbala, which Digbala becomes a part of, uh, we'll talk more about this in detail and like maybe how to use it. But I see a Digbala as a, um, as a spectrum. So it's not so much that the planet needs to be in this or that house, but if, if the nearer it is to that direction exactly. yep. in the heart. So if the moon's in the third and conjunct the IC, that's super that's powerful nice. dig bala. Or even if it's just in the third or and the, in the IC. Fifth. Or in the fifth. Yeah. yeah. And the IC is in the next sign. Like that's still really high. Like I take, I take the pointing systems with kind of a grain of salt. I look at them as like a more of a way to just like sort of, get a little bit more detail, right? But it's a spectrum. It's not, you yeah, know. Yeah, and, and at the same time, the MC will change. And if I'm not mistaken, the, the sun, how? Uh, the you, MC I'm, is the noon point, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cycle. But but in Hellenistic astrology, the sun gets rejoiced in the... The ninth. The ninth, which is close to the MC. Jupiter in the 11th, which is close to the, to the MC, uh, but it's also close to the first. So, so yeah. I mean, th there's a, there's like some type of uh, resemblance if you take into consideration the cusps, especially the MC and the IC, how they're going to change between the third and the fifth and the ninth and the eleventh. Uh, sure. 
so yeah, I mean, this is a way you can reconcile this. I mean, remember, these are ancient texts. They, they were not yeah. as specific yeah. as we are. Yeah, and for those who don't know what we're talking about, just look up Hellenistic astrology planetary joys and you'll see what we're talking about. And that is a scheme that I don't think was ever really supposed to be used for dignity personally, but okay. um, but it does have, it, it, it is a cool technique and there are ways to use it, but maybe we'll do a video on that one day. Yeah. And, and we're, we're mentioning these because these exaltation degrees in Hellenistic astrology predate the degrees in this text that are almost exactly as those degrees that we right. just So that's something that we have to take into consideration because once again, horoscopic astrology is a much newer development within Yotisha as, yeah. as, as an astrology of the Vedas. Right. Hey guys, we had to cut the last video a bit short. So we're back now to finish out chapter three. Uh, we're on Shloka 55, which concerns natural relationships, friendship, and enmity. So this is a really important area in um, Jyotish. And, Very important. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, this is the general scheme that most people utilize. So yeah, let's let's just jump right in. Uh, what yeah. did you want to say about it? Well, man, I just want to say, and I said this at the beginning of the video, chapter three is of supreme importance in Brihat Parashara Horashastra. And once again, just for people to know, Brihat Parashara Horashastra is basically the great treatise on horoscopic astrology by Parashara. And, and you know, these shlokas where you are, uh, where, where the reader uh, reads, where the reader reads, where the reader discovers the rules of friendship uh, is, is very important. And, and it is something that does not exist on other types of astrology uh as it does here specifically right you yeah. obviously have have the dignities and hellenistic astrology right but but this this relationship of dispositorship is is some and and not only dispositorship but you know position in the in the ecliptic in terms of zodiacal longitude to 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 figure out uh one type of friendship is is, is it's something very unique in jyotish right and and yeah. man you know we really don't know where this came from because as we discovered in Yavana Yataka, you know, the rules of friendship there are quite different from, from these rules. Yeah, yeah. And actually, there's another system of friendship that I've never been able to successfully do anything with. But it's discussed by al -Kabisi, and then Banadi replicates it in his text. So al -Kabisi was a Persian astrologer, for those who don't know. And it's, it's again, it's yet different from this or Yavana Jataka. So we have... We have at least three friendship schemes from the ancient texts, and I bet you there's more because there's so many untranslated texts. But you know, it's like this: this is the one that people have utilized the most, and is yeah. I think the clearest in terms of just basic assessment of dignity using friendships. Because basically, in in Jyotish, uh, instead of uh, you know, instead of using like all all of these, they use all these complex subdivisions, but instead of um, like in Hellenistic, they have all these like complex ways of assessing dignity that once you memorize and know, they're not that complex. But like this yeah. is much simpler, I would say. This is much more straightforward. And actually, uh, Al Biruni gives this methodology in his, uh, I think it's his introduction to astrology. Like he, he actually gives this, he says, and according to the Indians, there's another way of assessing dignity. And he gives this technique. And I thought it was so interesting because what he's basically saying is that you can do it either way. Like he wasn't saying like, oh, I do it this way, but just for completeness, I'm going to mention the Indian way. No, he's like, and the Indians do it this way. And you'll find that in a lot of old texts, like, oh, and the Indians do this thing with ninth parts, you know, and like, they don't, tell you, shit, right? they don't tell you how to use it. Yeah, they don't tell you how to use it in these Arabic Persian texts. They're just like, here's this. And so, you know, like we're, we're left to kind of ponder it ourselves, but so dignity, but you know, the more I work with dignities, the more I realize that it's actually, they're very multi-layered and subtle. And as we're going to see, even this simple technique can be modified by other factors in the Definitely. Chart, you know? And, and for people who don't know, you know, the overall friendship scheme is composed of three parts in Jyotish, and basically Parashar explains them here. 
Yeah. We already, we already know, and, and this is something very interesting that, that I, I wanted to talk about. You know, we have, we first discuss in this chapter three, uh, the, the special dignities of, of Mula Tricona, exaltation, debilitation, or Usha and Nietzsche. And, and it's, 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 it's a belief of mine that these are two different systems that are united here in Yotish. You know, uh, let's take out the Mula Tricona uh, degrees for, for a moment, but the ideas of Nisha and Ucha, I believe they come more from a Hellenistic background or maybe from a Babylonian background. Hmm. And okay. they got integrated with these friendship schemes. Why do I say that? Because if you watch the friendship scheme, you're going to see that the planets, uh, well, first of all, Mula Tricona is, is something that is from Jyotish, I believe, because that's something you don't see anywhere else. Uh, and okay. all planets get Mula Tricona in their own sign, except, uh, except uh, the moon, okay? Yeah, except the moon. But when, but when you see Nisha and Usha, it's very interesting because uh, planets don't necessarily get debilitated uh, in the signs of enemies per the Jyotish scheme, and they don't necessarily get exalted uh, in the houses of their friends per Jyotish scheme. And I'm going to get something here right out really fast so I can explain what I'm trying to say. Okay. So, for, for example, you know, exaltations, this is very interesting, you know, first of all, uh, you have one planet that gets exalted in its own sign. You have three planets that get exalted in friend sign. And then you get three planets that get exalted in neutral signs. Okay. So, you know, and, and that kind of doesn't make sense because, you know, it would be reasonable to say by, by these both schemes that planets should get exalted in their own, uh, I mean, in, in their friend's sign, right? Because it's the best place. But... Uh, with these two schemes, they they kind of uh, have some disparities in that planets can get exalted in neutral signs. Specifically, I'm talking about the moon that gets exalted in Taurus, which yeah. means neutral to the moon. Right. Mars gets exalted in Saturn. Hello, <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and that's, Saturn that's, and Saturn hates right. being in Mars Rashi's, and, and but Saturn is neutral to Mars, and um, Venus gets exalted in Pisces, who, who Jupiter is a neutral of, of them. And at the same time, the Nietzsche schemes are even more confusing because you have two planets that get debilitated in French signs. You have three planets that get debilitated in neutral signs. And then finally, you have two planets that get debilitated in Nietzsche signs or, yeah. or in any and I, I think that, uh, and in Hellenistic, you have a similar kind of complication where like, for example, it's auspicious for a planet to be in the sign of a sect mate, right? But when Mars is in Cancer, he's fallen, uh, for example. Exactly. Um, so I personally think that the principles of domicile and exaltation came far before this system of friendship and enmity. Probably. And that's why there's some confusion. And if we look at this shloka about natural relationships, about the logic behind it, of basically you're taking the signs which are fourth, second, twelfth, fifth, ninth, and eighth from the Mula Tricona of a planet, right? And then the planets that's, ruling such signs are its yeah. friends. But the thing is, is that in Yavana Jataka, we actually have a very similar idea to this, it's slightly different, I believe, in terms of which houses are stated. But Yavana Jataka is actually saying that this is how you assess temporary friendships, not natural friendships. And what it says is it doesn't say the planet's ruling, it says the planet's so placed. That's, so I, yeah. I, so I don't know if you remember, if you remember that video we made, because I got confused explaining. Right, you know, yeah. Things, remember. Yeah. Because it is confusing, yeah. Coming, coming, working because, our way backwards. Yeah, We're familiar with was, this. And then. Yeah, because I, back in that video, which was like the first or second video we made on Java and I was explaining this scheme. Yeah, of like the natural relationships. While you, you, you were you, you uh, while we were actually discussing the temporal uh, yeah. relationships, and I think Java and what he does is that he uses this as temporal relationships. But we're gonna discuss that. I, he I does. Just I just wanted I, I just, to point that out and say okay. that, like, maybe at a certain point, this technique changed and this became natural yeah. friendships. And that's 
that's very, that's what it looks like to me, you know, because now it's, it's a bit different. And of course the temporary friendships are even more different, you know? So yeah. I don't and, know. And, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I just want to ex, ex, expand on the idea of this, of this concept of being <sighs> different things, because at the same, and that's something I wanted to say, you know, these relationships that we're going to see, be further uh, further on, specifically now with the natural relationships, extrapolate from the Mula Tricona. So we, yeah. we can say that the Mula Tricona and these friendship schemes of of natural friendship, temporal friendship, and compound friendships are more of a Jyotish type, a, a, yeah. a concept of astrology, and the ideas of Nietzsche, Ucha, exaltation, debilitation, are more of a Hellenistic concept of a more, let's say, Babylonian. Yeah, Hellenistic Babylonian, yeah. That's very yeah. possible. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah. I'm i still, I, you know, no one's still totally certain of the about the origin oh, yeah. this, this, of the 12 yeah. signs and, zodiac. And, so. and just, yeah. just let me continue with this before sure. we continue. You know, uh, as I said, you know, when you have Nietzsche planets, they all get debilitated in... in in random signs in terms of this scheme that we're going to discuss now, the sun gets debilitated in Libra. Libra is an enemy. So that kind of makes sense. Right. But yeah. then the moon gets debilitated in Mars Rashi, who is a neutral to him, but Mars gets debilitated in the moon Rashi, who's a friend of his. So that kind of doesn't make sense. Oh Obviously. yeah, that's right. Mars is not technically yeah. a friend of the moon. I always forget that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the moon, uh, Mars gets debilitated in the moon. And this is, yeah. this is a weird because the moon it's is a friend, friend of his, right? right? And at the same time, Mercury gets debilitated in Jupiter Rashi, um, who's neutral to him. Yeah. Jupiter gets debilitated in Capricorn in Saturn, who is a neutral planet to him. Venus gets exalted. Um, I mean, Venus gets debilitated, I'm sorry. In Virgo, in, once again, like Mars, he gets debilitated in a French sign, which kind of doesn't make sense. And Saturn yeah. gets debilitated in, in Aries, uh, who is Mars Rashi, who is an enemy to his. So in this scheme, you know, the sun and Saturn debilitation kind of makes sense, but the other ones don't make sense. And really, you know, when you talk about this with astrologers, they, they have no explanation for it. You know, the idea of right. why... Why would, you know, why would Mars get debilitated in a French Rashi? And, and I think it doesn't make sense, the explanations. You know, you know, there's no logical explanation because I think these are two different systems. They are, yeah. And that, of course... are, that are stuck together. Yep. And, 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 you know, if, if Mars is in Cancer, it doesn't matter if the moon is a friend of, no, of, of that's, Mars yeah. for this, this scheme that we're going to discuss from Mula Tricona and temporary friendships it's debilitated because that's the principle from the this other type of system and and that's something that people have to recognize that is seldom talked about you know i yeah. don't know if you want to say anything else before we well start. i just want to say that the debilitations just arise naturally out of the exaltation so exactly the logic is just that a planet is debilitated in the sign opposite its exaltation and then later on in the the medieval astrology uh they started saying that a planet in a sign opposite its own domicile was in quote unquote detriment. Exile, which, exactly. Or exile, which I don't really, I don't really employ all that much. I don't really find that it works. Yeah. Well. You know, exile is tricky because in my experience, in my limited experience as a sure. young astrologer, you know, um, ex exile is, is, is not bad, but it's not good. Sure. And, yeah. and you can see this also with the friendship scheme in Jyotish, because usually yeah. exile positions will get will get a neutral dignity. Usually. Yeah. And usually. I mean, right, exactly. And like, you know, another thing, too, is like it's not enough for a planet to just be in one bad dignity, because exactly. oftentimes things will, will cancel each other out. Yeah. yeah like we have, um, you know, what is it? Is it called? Uh, is it called the uh, Viparit Raj Yoga or is that? Uh, Nicha Vanga. Yeah, those are two types of cancellations. Yeah. yeah, we have these cancellations of debilities. And then we also have situations in which like, 
you may go, oh, that that uh, that Jupiter's in uh, Libra there. It's in an enemy sign. Like, that's bad. But then Venus is aspecting it. And one of the fundamental principles of good astrology is that if the Lord or exaltation Lord aspects the sign, it empowers that house and planet, you know, and that's what's called reception in, in um, classical Hellenistic astrology. Which, right? would be, which would be Sambanda in a way in, yeah. in, in Yotish, in Sanskrit. Yeah, so you can't say like, oh, that's, that, that Venus is really harming that Jupiter. No, to me, that's actually a, a very good situation. What would be a worse situation if his Venus was in the 6th, 8th, or 12th and Jupiter were in that, from yeah. that Jupiter? you know, or something like that, and afflicted, right? If the Lord's in good condition, it helps the planet. If the Lord aspects the planet, it helps the planet, and so on. Even though Venus is technically an enemy of Jupiter, right? It's not one-dimensional. And same thing with Navamsha and Dwadasamsha, right? Like if a planet appears in mediocre condition dignity-wise, but then it's in its own sign in Navamsha, and to a lesser extent Dwadasamsha, it's going to be better. You know, it's going to be, it's going to have some oomph to it. It's, it's, so my friend always says, if things look really good, look a little bit deeper. If things look really bad, look a little bit deeper. That's a great advice. Yeah. And, and, I like and at that. the same time, it, it shows the complexity of astrology, of Vedic astrology, of, of Hellenistic yeah. astrology, as astrology as a whole. I mean, this is why astrology is not as easy as sun sign pop astrology. Yeah. And, and this is why, I mean, there's so many angles to it. There's so many mm -hmm. dimensions. Everybody who's seeing this video probably agrees with this because I don't think uh, the, the neophyte is going to watch this video. I doubt and, it. Yeah. And, and, you know, people have to realize that there's a lot of cancellations that don't usually, that don't usually get discussed here. And they that don't. you have to take in mind, such as, and not only that, Uchavanga which is the opposite of Nichawanga is, is a, is a very real thing that people usually don't talk about. You know, if you have Aries sun and Libra, um, Libra Saturn, who are probably going to be people who were born in, in, um, 83, 81, 80, maybe 79. I don't know. Sure. You know you're going to get both canceled out because you're going to have a great war. You're going to have a great opposition. Yeah. And, and, and that's going to be a talk of war that's going to pr prove problems. And, you know, we can do other types of, of right. Two super and, powerful planets that are not exactly. that are enemies that are in a, a very powerful relationship. And, you know, if we follow the Hellenistic and Tajika system a bit, right, that opposition is very productive of even more enmity between already and inimical planets so i actually yeah. have a friend who has that and you can see how it's worked out in their life as like a, a major challenge yeah and another and another classical ucha vanga that usually people don't well well not not usually but most neophytes fail to see is the idea of of uh, ucha from navamcha i mean nicha from navamcha i mean the idea that if you have a saturn in libra but the Saturn is in Aries in Navamsha. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. he's gonna be—he's not gonna be exalted. And, Problematic. And, yeah. and you know, we, you know, we can we can make and and obviously the different types of Nietzsche Vanga that there are, you know, Kendra from Moon, mutual reception. You know, th there's a lot of other things that people have to realize before just jumping into conclusions. And another thing I wanted to say, uh, Lars, that I didn't mention before, in terms of this idea of being this these of of these two systems being two different uh, systems of dignity is that Parashara, as we're going to see, never justifies or explains why, for example, Mars is debilitated in a French Rashi or why. Right. Nope. Uh, he or, leaves us to do that. <laughs> yeah, he never explains that. And I, I think it has to do with the idea that these are two different systems. Yeah. Because once again, and we're going to see this throughout this book, you know, this is not as old as people wanted to think it is in my yeah. opinion i mean there's probably here knowledge that is way 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 antique right. way old way archaic but this was written probably between the seventh and eighth century yeah and by that time we already have a thousand years of hellenistic astrology uh we're starting to see uh the beginnings more or less of of, of arabic astrology persian astrology sure and you know Jyotish has been influenced by all these types of astrology so far. Yeah. In addition to its native uh, Vedic Yotisha, which has to do with the nakshatras, 
which has to do with the, with the titis, the caranas, yeah, the electional that. type of Vedic astrology. So, so there's stuff. a mix. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, and we also can see that with the Rashis and the Nakshatras that we just discussed. I mean, and, and that's something that we have to take into mind. So let's, let's first discuss this idea of natural relationships. You know, and, and this is called in Sanskrit, Graha Maitri, okay? And, and basically, um, this is basically, uh, Graha Maitri is divided into uh, Naisargika, a, a Mitra or Shatru, which is basically natural friends or enemy friends, which is going to be the natural relationship. Yeah. Kalika Mitra, which is temporary relationships, which is the second fold of the, the system of friendships. And the final one is the compound friendship, which is called Pancha Damaitri, or fivefold friendships. And the first one, which is also Naisargika, Nice in, the, yeah. in the Graha Maitri or planetary relationships is basically to find out who are the enemies, friends, and neutrals of a planet. And this is very easy, man. Uh, and I have a, a code for it in Spanish, which is uh, dos, tres, entre dos, eh, I'm sorry, entre tres y dos a la cuatro, which basically means in between the third and two to the square power, which means like Always, 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 the, plan, the positions, for, first of all, you got to know the Mula Tricona. You take the Mula Tricona of a planet, and the signs before and after, 12 and second, are friends. The third is an enemy. Four and fifth are friends. Then you repeat that two times. Uh, four, and fifth, uh, four and fifth are friends. Six and seven are enemies. Eight and nine are friends. And 10 and 11 are enemies. And that's how you find it. Yeah, now, and then exaltation sign is always exactly, friendly. Exactly. Yeah. And if you have an exaltation, it cancels out uh, any possible enmity. And at the same time, if you get one and one, then it's neutral. And that's how it is, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I have some pictures, but I, I man, you know, I have, I have all this in my Instagram. I should have, I should have, you know. Uh, let me let me check my Instagram. I can check it from here. So okay, cool. If, if, if you want to continue talking while I yeah. open my Instagram, so, so I can show this, the people these these images. Um, yeah, Santanam, the translator and editor, has given a nice table here so that we can just you know refer back to it and stuff. And as you can oh see, yeah, and that table is of nice. supreme importance if you yeah, want to practice this. You got to learn that by heart. That's yeah, like it's the great. basic ABCs. Right, right. It's great. It's great. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, you just kind of, you just memorize this over time and uh, eventually it just becomes second nature and whatnot. Um, you know, you'll find things like Jupiter is the enemy of no planet, which really makes sense. Okay. Yes. Um, the moon has no enemies, which also makes sense because the moon is the mind, right? And so, you know, and all planets are like sort of qualities of the mind so how could the moon really have any enemies right it does have friends but um and you know some people consider jupiter to be kind of like a honorary friend of the moon because even though he's not in this scheme it's just like jupiter moon is so good or so like helpful i should say helpful you know um but yeah, Jupiter's no, he's not an enemy to anyone. And then basically the rest of it is, you know, the, the rest of it's a bit odd, you know, like, um, uh, for example, let's see. Um, I, I, ha I have the, the scheme here so people can see it. This is, this, I did this a while ago. Can I show it, uh, Lars? Yeah. Uh, you want to share the screen? Yeah. Okay. You have to unshare yours. Yeah. Okay. And I'll share mine. Cool. So I did this a while ago, and it's something so simple that I never saw any other astrologer do. Nice. And, and basically, this means amistad is friendship, and enemistad is um, uh, enmity, right? Okay. And you have all the planets in their Mula Tricon. Everybody knows that. So basically, you have the sun. Here, you see how it's going to turn out, the natural friendship. You know, it's the two, the two signs. The blue is friend, and the it's in Spanish, but it's easy to, to understand. The blue is friend and the red is enemy. So okay. here we see that although um, Mercury signs, one is a friend and the other is an enemy, it turns out neutral because they cancel each other out for the sun. Okay. okay. Now we have the moon here and <laughs> look at all the cancellations you have. 
right? Oh wow! And this is very, yeah. this is very interesting. Look at this. Um, wow. The third one is an enemy, but it is his own sign. So oh, it that's interesting. Turns into Swakchetra, right? Yeah. Uh, wow. But most of them, you know, cancel each other out, uh, uh, which is quite interesting. And this is why the enemy has no no real enemies, as you said, because yeah. they all cancel each other out. Uh, then we have uh, Mars. And we see the has a cancellation with Venus signs, and then we see that with um, Saturn, although he's a he's an enemy, it gets cancelled out because of the exaltation. And you see here how the system works, right? Wow, yeah, it's very good stuff. I really like these tables. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm man. like seeing it in Spanish too. Like, yeah, Spanish is just such a beautiful language. So it's it's yeah. just cool. <laughs> and, 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 and it's really, I, and let me tell you, I've never seen any American or British or Indian astrologer have these tables, which are so helpful for understanding this topic. Look at yeah. Mercury, all the cancellation it has. You know, wow. it, and once again, you see the same thing with the Swakshetra sign. You know, the enemy sign uh, gets turned into a, a good sign because it falls into its own uh, domicile, right? And, and, and I forget, why, why did the cancellations happen like this? We, we just touched oh, on oh, it. it, it because if there's a friend, because the same planet owns a friend sign and an enemy sign in relation to the Mulatikwana of the planet in question. So oh, it becomes, wow. okay. and you see this here for Mars Rashis, for example, Aries is friend to Mercury in Mulatikwana, but Scorpio is an enemy to Mercury in Mulatikwana, so they cancel each other out. Oh, so okay, wow, wow. Yeah, that's right, that's, that's cool. That's, okay. Isn't it this, this is crazy? And yeah. then you see them neutral, neutral, neutral. And then we have Jupiter, which once again has the same thing with Saturn. You know, he gets, he, he becomes neutral because um, he um, doesn't um, have, um, because he becomes neutral because he's have, he has both of them there. Yeah. And I wanted to show this, you know, it's really interesting because, oh no, no, we're gonna see that with Venus. Okay. okay. And then Venus, here it is. Look at this. Jupiter is not an enemy to any, uh, to any planet, but, in Venus, oh my God, I, I change it. In Venus, he is uh, an enemy to Venus, but he gets canceled out because Venus gets the exaltation sign in Pisces. Wow. Can you see that? Right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and Mars, it becomes neutral because of the same reason as Mercury. And finally, Saturn, whose only cancellation is um, Jupiter, who becomes hence... Um, a neutral so yeah that's yep. basically the, the, the this is the reason why this natural scheme exists so um very helpful yeah thanks for that yeah and i have another one for the temporary friendship and another one for the compound friendship so we could do that great um, yeah let's do it yeah let's 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 read this shloka and then go this back shloka. to this okay so i'm gonna unshare my screen okay you share yours. great <laughs> i love zoom man yeah, Zoom is good stuff, Zoom and it's great, yeah, and it's uh, you know it's it's free. Um, yeah. For uh, you don't you know you can't do certain things with the free account, but I'm I'm using a free account to make all my videos, and it's been great. So uh, people should get Zoom and mess around with it. It's also good for solo videos too. So true, true. Uh, okay, yeah. So temporary horoscopic relationships, this which is, is called Takalika Mitra, or temporary friendships. Great. What does it say there? Let's see. So the planet posited in the 10th, 4th, 11th, 3rd, 2nd, or 12th from another planet becomes its mutual friend. There is enmity otherwise. So th this is quite interesting because we have basically the two squares as being friendly, the two sextals as being friendly, and then the 2nd or 12th as being friendly for this scheme, even though normally, right, planets in the 2nd and 12th from one another, not great, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and, everything and in, in Jyotish, its context, yeah. And in Jyotish, they're, they're not that good either if they're uh, malefic planets. That's where you get Papa Katari, right? Or you can yeah. get Chuba Katari or Hemming, which is also right. called. Right, Hemming. Yeah, right. Um, and so then what's left is the conjunction, the opposition, the ninth, fifth, sixth, and eighth house to become en you know, enemies. So it's it's always been interesting to me that uh, planets in a conjunction 
our en- enemies, you know, like, uh, and then opposition too. But what we have to remember is that this temporary friendship scheme, as we're going to see in the compound of relationship here, is really not, is really to assess dignity. So this is like the idea if like, a moon was in Aries and Mars was there in Aries with the moon, that now Mars, is, that now the moon's dignity decreases in Aries. So exactly. instead of being in a neutral sign, right? It's now in a in an enemy sign. Exactly. Right? It goes down. So, but on the other hand, you have the Lord sitting there with the moon, which does help the moon. But I think the idea is that um, is that it's almost like the planet, even though it helps, it's like an overbearing mother. You know, it's like a it's like a mother that's doing too much for the kid or whatever, <laughs> or it's like a, it's like a host in the house. That's like just dominating the guests too much. Like here, do you want more food here? Do you want more drinks here? You know, or just talking, talking, talking. And like the guest is treated well, but, but doesn't have as much individuality, you know? So we have to be, I bring that up cause we have to be like playful and creative with these techniques in order to weave a story. Cause doing a reading is about weaving a story and generally speaking the story you weave with your imagination is actually going to be correct because they're you know if you're tuned in there's a reason you're you're going to those metaphors and they'll probably have some sort of actual correspondence with the person's life yeah man and you know um the the idea of this temporary um this temporary friendship is is basically the idea of the longitudes of the planets in the zodiacal band in the ecliptic. It's basically the idea of how, you know, obviously we have we have the thing uh, here with with the three signs next and the three signs before. So it's the idea of are you more or less in my hemisphere or are yeah. you in the opposite hemisphere? Of course. Conjunctions will be um, the exception. Yeah, that's the one exception. Yes, and you know I have the scheme here. I I I don't have the um, I don't have I I don't have the the graph, but I can use it from my video. So I just want to show the graph so people sure. see what I'm trying to say. Okay. So let's share mine. So I'm gonna go to a YouTube video of mine where I explain this. So basically, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. That's me over there. Okay. Uh, basically, this is how you, you figure it out. Uh, the, this is planet X, not necessarily Nibiru, for all of the um, Sakaraya Sitchin fans out there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, basically, it doesn't matter what, what Rashi it is. Let's just suppose there's a planet here in Aries, right? Okay. So the idea is that the three planets next and the three planets before are friends. So this is the idea that, okay, planets in my hemisphere are helping me. Planets that are close to me, but not too close to me, are helping me. And actually, you know, if you get two benefics between uh, a planet in two separate houses set to, uh, to two, uh, in the two signs before and after where you are, yeah. that's, that's benefic. That's a benefic hemming, right? Right. Um, if if you get uh, uh uh if you get basically the sex styles, it's also very positive. Uh, you kind of get a planetary aspect in Yotisha, uh, in the third by uh, sometimes by sixty percent or fifty percent. So it's it's there, and then you obviously have um the Kendras, right? Um, yeah. And and although and this is something that might we might discuss further on. Although in Hellenistic astrology, um you know, uh, squares are not that good. In Jyotish, squares are, are usually, you know, beneficial, uh, unless there are other characteristics that, that impede that beneficence. So you see here yeah. the temporary relationship. Now, the enemies are going to be the planets that are in the other hemisphere from uh, the um, planet uh, we're discussing, right? Yeah. And, and it's really interesting because the trines are there, <laughs> which, yeah. is, which is crazy. Uh, but, you know, planets and trines usually, uh, in terms of temporary relationships, don't work. You have, obviously, oppositions. And, and then you have the eighth and the, and the sixth, which, which kind of makes sense. 
Uh, right, right. And, and I mean, like, it, it is just like my perspective, but my perspective is this is really supposed to be for dignity analysis, because otherwise Jupiter would become an enemy to every planet that he aspected by his special aspects. And that just doesn't make sense, right? And, and I don't see how to use that in practice. So like, for me, if I'm assessing- and we, and we haven't even touched the idea of aspects yet, but yeah. Right, but for me, if I'm assessing the, like from, um, like using something as a lagna, right? Like, let's say I just take any old sign as a lagna because it, you know, I wanna read from it and it's not the lagna. But anyway, like I'm gonna say that, you know, the fifth and ninth house from it are very supportive, like positive auspicious houses, right? But that's different than thinking in terms of this friendship and enmity, because as we're gonna see in the next shloka, right? We combine the natural and temporary to see basically, to basically- The compound, the compound. Yeah, really. But to basically get the dignity for planets not in their own signs, right? Like if Mars is in Taurus, it's in a neutral sign, okay? By natural, Nisargika, friendship right but then by this scheme okay we have to look and see where is venus relative to mars well if venus is in the second or the tenth or the third right it's then a temporary friend of mars so mars is instead of being in a neutral dignity mars is now in a friendly dignity so mars gets a boost but if that same venus were in the seventh house from that mars or the sixth house or the ninth house that Mars becomes in a temporary enemy sign, right? Because it gets a it gets a deduction from the neutral. So I'm I am jumping ahead, I realize, but I just I want to clarify that because um, the, uh, that otherwise, like you don't the print the basic principles of astrology will break down if you start to use this for something other than dignity. In my opinion, does that make sense? Yeah, but what would you use it other than dignity for? Like, if you were to say, like, oh, look, Mars and Venus are um, in, like, a trine, and so they're enemies. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. You, you, don't, you don't use... No, 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 no. Temporary. Right. People have to realize temporary... Re okay, I understand now. Yeah, Temporary yeah. relationship is not supposed to be used alone. Right. Uh, exactly. Natural friendship can be used alone. Yes, it can, it can be. Specifically... Yeah. Specifically with some Avashtas. Right. But this idea of, of, of temporary relationship has to be used only in relationship to the natural relationship scheme in order to find out the final dignity in terms of friendship. Yeah. Because it's not only necessary to have a friend, but you need to have that friend in the right place at the right time to help you. Yeah. And this is the idea between the passive uh, significators and the active significators, right? The theory and the practice. And the theory would be the scheme of friendship that we discussed before. And the practice would be the idea of where these planets are in the ecliptic in terms of uh, zodiacal longitude. Right, but, but just real quick, like let's say like, let's take that same example and say um, Mars and Venus are naturally neutral to each other, but let's say one's in Leo and one's in Sagittarius, right? So they don't have any natural dignity and so on, like according to their own signs. Right, I still wouldn't think of those two planets as being enemies. I mean, you could, but I wouldn't do it. But because... they're not enemies. Right, be, right, because because we're using this to assess dignity, not to assess just mere exactly. placements relative to one yeah, another. Yeah. So do, that's do what I'm trying that? to. I don't know. I don't no, think. I don't I think, think, so, think no. I've encountered that, but I just like. I just want to clarify that because, oh no, actually uh, somebody, I did see somebody doing it once. Yep. That's, so that's why I'm talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it probably was an Indian astrologer. No, it, it, it wasn't. Actually. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's so him. anyway, anyway, I'm not going to okay. name any names. But you know, but... in transit, trines are not bad. People have to realize right. that. Right. Yeah. But in terms of trines in relation to the natural friendship scheme, in relation to the compound friendship scheme, you know, it's something that has to do with the whole complete picture of the chart. And, yeah. and you know, and, and, you know we're, we're getting ahead with the trines here, but sometimes when people have a lot of planets and trines, it's, it's usually intense, you know, and, and it usually sure. can bring out some difficulties. And another thing that we have to remember, and this is something that we can extrapolate for the rest of the book, is that, here, conjunctions 
are not necessarily uh, good in terms of this compound uh, relationship. Not because of, of enmity between planets or friendship between planets, it's because of space. It's because the best thing to have in a chart is well dignified planets, one in each house, one in each sign. You know, give them enough space and that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, because with conjunctions, you get problems because you get two people in one space trying to do two different things. It's like two people sure. in the kitchen trying to cook different things. No matter if they're friends or enemies, there's going to be problems. Right. And then right. might work things out. Uh, enemies will probably have a difficult time. Right. And then, but then again, like just for, just for clarity, like, it, you know, Jupiter Venus conjunction in Pisces, like that's great. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? well, uh, that's great, but that's going to bring difficulties. Well, I, I don't necessarily think so though. Oh because... yes. And, oh, let me tell you how, okay. okay. It's going to be well... great. It's going to be great, but the person will be divided in that house because the, the thing here is, is that in, in the house, the dignity is going to be okay, but in the house, in the area of life, there are going to be two different things going on there. For example, you have, you're, you're cooking in the kitchen, Venus and, and Jupiter are two great chefs, but one wants to do pasta and the other wants to bake a cake. So, I mean, they might work together, but, but the idea is that if they were separated, it probably would have been better. It's the I, idea of, com, of, of being convoluted in one I, area only. Yeah, I, I can see what you're saying. And of course, like I'm doing this out of context. So they, you know, we'd have to look at the whole context, but I'm just saying that like, again, this principle of like enmity by conjunction, like this is to me strictly for assessing dignity. So if, um, you know, Jupiter is in Libra and Venus is in Libra, well, okay, cool, because Venus receives Jupiter, but Jupiter's dignity goes down because he's overwhelmed by Venus. So Jupiter yeah. ends up in a great enemy sign. But if the two planets are in a sign that uh, they both have dignity in, or they don't have, um, or they don't have any sort of like natural uh, affinity for, like if they were both in um, Aries. Let's say, let's say sun, sun, oh, oh, okay, okay. Like Jupiter and Venus in Aries, okay? Like, to me, this isn't, um, I can't say if that conjunction is like positive or negative without checking a couple other things. Oh, definitely. Because like, I'm not going to see the conjunction as naturally inimical. Like the conjunction is the most neutral relationship. It's not yes, even considered yes, but, an aspect. But, but, yeah, 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 definitely. We're yeah. saying the same thing. Okay, but cool. But the idea is that we're not seeing it as negative or positive. We're seeing okay. it as, a, as, as an area that's going to be convoluted. There are going to be two different planets competing for the same resources for different agendas in the same place. And that's, that's, that's fair. Problem. Yeah, that makes sense. That doesn't mean that they're not going to be able to work together, although that's possible. And that doesn't mean they're going to be fighting with each other, although that's also possible. Because right. you're going to check that out by doing the following steps that you are addressing in terms of uh, seeing the additional dignities that are involved. Yeah, and this is where plan. I mean, this is where planetary war comes in, which is kind of the apex. Oh yeah, but that's the, another. Yeah, that's, that's another a, technique, of course. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, the the thing is, is like you know, like anything in astrology, a, a, a combination can be very auspicious for some things while simultaneously being inauspicious for other things. Like a Jupiter Venus conjunction could bring a man like abundant women in his life, like a lot of wealthy, attractive, beautiful women, and so on. But then like, what if one of those planets rules like the sixth house or the 12th yeah. house, right? There might yeah. be some and that's lots, where things, a lot of expenses happening. You yeah. know, he's spending a lot of money on these beautiful yeah. women. So. But in principle, once again, conjunctions are going to represent the idea of two, three, four planets coming together into one Rashi and competing for those Rashi's resources to do different agendas. Now, sure. those okay. agendas can, can, conf, can be uh, can, complementary. Can, can complementary if they form Raja Jogas, for example. Yeah. But if there are Dushtanas there, six and eighth and, and, and 12 or yeah. Ishalayas in combination with Kendra Lords and in combination to Tricona Lords, then there's going to be problems. So you see, that's, that's more or less the idea. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't say conjunctions are negative or positive. Conjunctions only represent this. Then you have to see dignity. 
Then you yeah. have to see lordships. Then you have to see aspects. Then you have to see abashtas. Then you have to see mutual reception. Because if you get if you get conjunctions with mutual reception, you 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 complicate things even more. So yeah, yeah. we're just starting to to talk about temporary relationships, and we're just uh, way ahead of things. So yeah, this is yeah. the idea: of temporary relationships. And now we're going to be discussing complement uh, compound friendships, where we actually bring together the natural scheme with the temporary scheme to find out the final result. So let's read that shloka. Great. Okay. Stop share. Yeah. Okay, so here it is. Can you see it? Yes, compound relationships. Should two planets be naturally and temporarily friendly, they become extremely friendly. Friendships on one count and neutrality on another count makes them friendly. Yeah. <laughs> Enmity on the count, I can't read. Sorry, I'm on one count combined, one with combined with affinity on the other turns into equality. Enmity and neutral ship causes only enmity. Oh my God! Now we're should there be enmity in both manners? Extreme enmity is obtained. Yeah. Scholars should consider these and declare horoscopic effect accordingly. Yeah, that that final one is the is the is the key. I want to show the chart so okay, I can. Great. So I'm gonna show mine. You showed you showed yours. Now I show mine. Okay. <laughs> Sounds a little gay, bro. <laughs> no, no. Okay, so let me just let me just get out of here. So I'm gonna go to my. So yes. So I want to show this first, so people can see this. This is basically the natural friendship scheme that people have to have in mind, and also how debilitation and exaltation works out before we move on to, to compound relationships that I wanted to show this. This is the sun okay. and, and all its possible uh, uh, natural dignities, right? Okay. And, oh my God, that's not the one I wanted to do. Uh, here we go. And then we have uh, the moon here, right? Neutral, neutral. We see all the neutrals, right? After yeah. the cancellations. The Mars, right? Then we have Mercury, all the neutrals after cancellations. Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. Cool. Now, let's do the compound relationship, which is, oh, where is it? Oh, where is it? Oh, my God. Wait. <laughs> That's okay. Here it is. Okay, right? cool. Okay, here, here you see more or less the idea. Blue, blue, blue means uh, friend, red means enemy, and we're going to see here. Oh, I friend, see what you're doing there. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Friend, natural friendship, temporary <laughs> friendship, friend plus friend. Is great friend. I like the little smiley faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Friend plus enemy is neutral. Neutral plus plus friend is is friend. Neutral yeah. plus enemy is enemy. Enemy plus friend is neutral. And enemy plus enemy is great enemy. And you know, um, usually they refer to these as pancha damaitri, but in reality. Yeah, they just take the neutral ones and they just put it as if it were one, but it's technically six types of scenarios where we can get this. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, let's go to the other chart I have here. Oh my God, where is it? Is it here? This is, this is the, no, this is the plain one. Uh, is it here? These are all the possible combinations. Wow. Uh, is it here? No, it's not. Where is it, man? I know I have it here. I'm sorry. Oh, God. Where is it? Yeah, I, I, if you want to start talking while I look for my for my other ones. I'm sorry. Okay, sure. So what this what this ends up what this ends up doing is giving us the dignities for the planets in the Rashi chart mainly and we can use it in divisionals as well. But when planets are not Swaketra in their own sign or exalted right which i forget what the sanskrit for that is but. ucha 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 yeah when when the planets are not ucha or swaketra right so basically you know this leaves a lot of room for variations right we can have planets in great friend signs which is very good friend signs which is you know good okay neutral which is like man nah, i'm just gonna sit here and like eat a mediocre kind of meal you know like just going to heat up some mac and cheese and like, it's okay. It's not great. Enemies, which is like, all right, like 
I'm stressing, you know, I'm starting to stress. <laughs> this is not fun. Great enemy, which is like, holy shit. Like here, like the Huns are at my, my door. They're about to like take down my wall, my great wall or whatever, uh, my wall of Rome or whatever it was that I, you know, I'm fucking up the history here. But anyway, like, you know, the great enemy is like, damn, like you're really a lot of anxiety, a lot of, uh, lot of challenges and so on and then of course you'll get you know after that comes fallen state which is like you're you know you're in the pits you know you're just you're in the dark night of the soul or whatever so basically we have a spectrum of like exaltation own sign you know a slight mula tricona own sign and then down the all the friendship schemes and then basically debilitation so we have quite a gradation of dignities you know and we can look at these in all of the different, um, you know, we can look at these in all the different divisionals. You know, we're, we're not going to discuss divisionals now because that's a later chapter. I think that's chapter six where they're introduced. But um, it's, you know, it's quite a nice tool to just get a basic sense of like, what is this planet? How is this planet going to behave? You yeah. Know? And, and, like, and another, another analogy that I use is that when a planet is in exaltation, he's basically on a holiday and then all inclusive with buffets, uh, with girls massaging his feet, offering sex, yeah. or with male offering massage and offering sex if you're a girl or a guy that likes guys. Yeah. You know, when you are, yeah. Yeah. When you're Mula Tricona, then you're in your house. You're not in your holiday, but you're in your house, but you have everything. You have internet, you have your big screen TV, your books, your 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 stereo. Now when you're Swakshetra, you're still in your house, but Maybe the internet has a little bit of problems. Maybe you got to go to the uh, to the store or to the supermarket to buy things. But you're in your house, man. You're in your yeah. house, right? Yeah. But then, if you're in a great friend sign, you're no longer in your house. You're in your right. best buddy's house. I'm in, I'm in Lars' house. Hey, yeah. Lars, what's going on here? Oh, my God, this is messed up. You got to clean your house. <laughs> yeah. But we're, we're, we're buddies. We're, we're, yeah, we're, yeah. we're having fun, you know. <laughs> And whatever, we're playing games and whatever, and, and no homo. And then, you know, <laughs> you, and then if you are in a friend sign, then yeah. you're no longer in your best friend sign, in your best friend's house. You're in a, in a buddy's house. So you're just, you know, hanging out, but you don't have that. Yeah, that you got to, like, ask. Like, you got to ask if it's yeah. okay to get something yeah, out yeah, of the yeah. fridge. You just know him. You haven't seen him, like, in six years. So yeah, yeah. Know, yeah. But, you, you know, you, you get together. Now, if you're in a neutral sign then you are in an airbnb like you yeah, are going or, to a new city yeah or what i'm sorry or you're in like the friend of a friend's house like no 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 oh yeah 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 not exactly. real you exactly. don't really know that person yeah. you don't know that person like, uh, i don't know if it's okay to sit here or yeah yeah like yeah. where do i put yeah. my jacket yeah. like, i don't know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and i mean it's not gonna be good it's not gonna be bad it's depending on how you you deal with it yeah and then then you get to enmity that's where it up. you're going yeah. to bunk with your enemy your nemesis this is going to be like a war unfortunately you know this is going to be and this is not going to be a big war this is going to be like the idea of you know that person won't respect you and you won't respect him and then yeah the great enemy is the idea of you bunking bets with your worst enemy it's like it's like tesla with edison it's like yeah. rome with kartash it's like it's like hitler with um with Stalin, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's like Trump with, uh, with Rachel Maddow. I don't know. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's really yeah. bad. I mean, this is really bad. And yeah. then you have, and then you have the ability where you're basically homeless. You're homeless. Yeah. <laughs> you're, and, and these are like, these are like different kinds of jobs too. Like an enemy job is like a job you really don't like. A great enemy job is where like you're abused by your boss and your coworkers, right? Versus like the great friend is like you're, you know, you, you love your coworkers and your boss is good to you. It's a nice job. But if you're like in your own sign or like military Kona or like exaltation, like, you know, you, you're like an independent, you know, free agent. And, and if you're exalted, right, you're like, you're like, you're like the Lord of your own business with like employees and, you know, and so on. Like, you know, you could just think of it as so many different metaphors, but. Yeah. And can you see the chart here? Yeah. So man, you know, I did this chart, these these charts because I've never seen any fucking astrologer do this and I wanted to do them. That's really funny. Huh? And and I ex and I and you know, if anybody's seeing this and you want to take these and translate it into English, do it. 
I mean, it's very easy. Uh, basically, here are all the possible compound friendships for the sun in a chart. Cool. So, I like I it. Mean, yeah, that's really if useful. This, if the sun is in Capricorn, he can only be neutral or great enemy. If the sun is mm. in Virgo, he can only be friend or enemy. Wow. Now, you, yeah. you see here how, and, and this is why I say that these are two different schemes, because see how exaltation and debilitation just cancels out everything? And just, you know, it's like, move away. <laughs> you know, like, like, let's do this. And this is how it is, you know. Uh, then you have the moon. And although the moon does not have any enemy, you have to remember that the moon can get an enemy dignity, <laughs> which is something that people usually don't, don't recognize. You know, uh, when yeah. you have a neutral sign, you can either become a friend or, or an enemy. Point. Right. That's how it is. And, and if you see, you know, moon gets debilitated in zero three. And, and you know, these, these schemes, these two different schemes also present a problem with Mercury and the moon, as we're going to see. You know, the moon gets debilitated from zero to three, right? But then from three to 30 in Scorpio, zero three Scorpio, I'm sorry, uh, he gets friend and enemy signs. So, you know, usually people sure. think that the moon gets debilitated in all of Scorpio but it's just in the first three degrees. Yeah, okay. yeah, according to this system. And, and I've always kind of, I've always kind of liked that. Um, yeah, of course. Even though moon, I don't the really. Through all these signs, you know. The I don't moon, end up using it though, to be honest. Like I typically just think of the Scorpio moon as debilitated, but then within that, there's a lot of wiggle room. Like there's a exactly. lot of. Exactly, wiggle uh, room. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not, it's not the same all throughout it, like you're saying. I just, I guess I just use it more generally. I look at you know, look at the gradations. But, you know, one thing I wanted to mention real quick is I just realized too, like one of the things that I believe cancels out a lot of this stuff is something called, uh, it's a yoga and I can't remember the name. It's where two planets just exchange signs. What is Paribartana. that? Yeah. Parib Paribartana. Yeah. Cause the like, mutual exchanges. Yeah. Well, like for example, in my tropical chart, I have moon in Pisces, uh, and Jupiter in cancer. Right, so they're in Parivartana, like very powerful, and Jupiter's even making a full, very close That's aspect. That's a 7-Eleven. <laughs> That's a what? 7-Eleven. Is it? Wait, what? Oh, yeah, 7-Eleven, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, the oh, yeah, like the store, yeah. So like, so that yoga means that I hang out at 7-Elevens a lot and like drink a lot of big Slurpee cup drinks. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway. That means uh, that you can that means, that means you can make businesses with people. You can make uh, really good friendships and associations in order to reach your goals and aspirations. Yeah, I think you're right, definitely. But anyway, like my point is, is you could look at it and say, well, uh, Ju um, Jupiter's a, you know, it's neutral to the moon and now it's a temporary enemy. So the moon's in a, a great enemy sign. But to me, that doesn't really, that or it's in an enemy sign. That, that doesn't really... I don't really think that works, you know, because they're in this Parivartana, and um, this is this is where astrology gets complicated. We're yeah. just in, we're just in chapter three, and we're already like deepening into stuff that is. It's this is why you need to study and read because yeah, and this, this and this is why computers will never be able to do astrology. No, not because not for real. The level yeah. of, of of not only logical mercurial ability, but that idea of the of the lunar intuition is so important in order yeah, to Yeah, exactly. Um, you, you really need to, and I always say that at a certain point, you need to feel what the planet or the chart or the yoga is saying, because if you, you can overanalyze it to death, but that's not gonna give you a story. That's not gonna give you something uh, tangible, right? If it's all just this mathematical kind of like, yeah. or semi-mathematical principles, you have to be able to say, well, you know, after analyzing this, I feel overall this planet is very strong and like the blights on it are this and this, which are going to cause like these kinds of issues, but overall it's very nice. And so then you start to imagine like, oh, it's like a, a nice Jupiter with some blemishes. What is that? That's like a, that's like a wealthy person or a priest that also maybe like has uh some issues here and there, you know, like whatever kind of issues it would be, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. you know, so you start to put it together and imagine it and that's where it comes to life. So let's move on here. Cool. Then we have Mars. These are all the possible dignities, compound dignities. As you can see, you know, Mercury, once again, we have the same problem with, uh, with the moon here in Pisces. Uh, right. Then we have Jupiter. 
which look at all the different types of, of dignities it can have. And then finally, Venus and Saturn. And there you go. And that's basically compound relationship. Cool. Uh, temporary and, and, friend, and natural friendship. So yeah, we spent an hour here. So <laughs> yeah, yeah I, hope, I hope people understand it. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Uh, hopefully, right. And we're still not done with the chapter. So, um, yeah. you know, let's move on. I think we've covered that really well. And we'll we'll be coming back to it in later videos where in later chapters where we'll be talking about, hey, remember this and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, and and then we have the ratio effects, which I also have here. So let me just. OK, let me just share yeah. it. OK, so yeah, real and real quick. Um, it's can basically. You, can you see yeah. Me? Uh, yeah. So basically. Um, if you share it now, yeah, yeah should work. Yeah, uh, continue. Cool, yeah, so basically the ratio effects is like what we were talking about, but mathematical, right? Like, Here we have it. Uh, exaltation gives 100% power, right? Mula Tricona, 75%, Swaketra, 50%, and so on and so forth, like down, down the line. And you can see the, the enemy dignities are just the worst, you know, because you get 93.33% yeah. Of Ashuba Fala, which is like negative force. Okay. Great enemy is ninety six point sixty seven, and debilitation is a hundred percent. Yeah. So, so you know, yeah, and 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 here's where you understand, for example, the Mahapurusha yogas of why planets in exaltation, Muletrigona or Sakshetra in Kendras are great, because they get at least fifty percent from great uh, from great friendship downwards. It just drops a lot. And neutral is just zero percent, for example. So yeah. yeah, yeah, people have to have that in mind in terms. This is why you know planets in great dignity are are always good. Are always yeah, good. and this is this is also like we're not. This isn't even the full measure of a planet's strength, which is what sh things like yeah. Shambhala yeah, are exactly. for. This this <laughs> is this is just the quality of what it can produce. Not even in terms of good and bad, but in terms of actually like. How completing its agendas yeah completing its agenda like how jupiter is this jupiter like a jupiter in pisces or or is you know according to this a jupiter in pisces would be about 50 percent jupiter let's say um and you know these you should not use these rigidly these are sort of just like gen general things but um whereas a jupiter in like virgo for example uh where it would be potentially in a great enemy sign let's say it's in a great enemy sign for this particular example right jupiter and virgo that's really un-jupiterian so like it's not that jupiter could never produce good things but jupiter has to go through all of this non-jupiterian stuff it's like when you have to wait in a really long line at the fucking dmv to get your stupid driver's license you know and you're just waiting there for like three hours right I instead of just like walking into the dmv <laughs> express and taking like 10 minutes right so so like, you know, a planet in good dignity walk, that's like a guy walking into the DMV express, like just gets licensed, like everyone's nice, but like bad dignity has got to wait there at the regular DMV. And like, then the DMV people are like shitty to him and like people's kids are screaming and it smells like a, a gross airplane. And like, you can tell that I really don't like the DMV. And so, uh, but you know, it's that kind of thing. So like, do I eventually get my license? Uh, maybe. Right. Because I could get it, but I might also be like, this is bullshit. I have to get back to work. Like I've been here three hours. I'm not going to get it. I have to come back at another point. Right. So these are all kinds of like, these are the examples you want to you want to generate in your mind when you're learning this stuff, because they, they help make sense of it. You know, so. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, um. People have to realize this is just the tip of the iceberg, as you were saying. Um, there, yeah. there are a lot of things that we have to take into mind. You know, let's let's finish up this chapter. And I was going to tell you, Lars, I think we should stop in three and just, you know, make another video for the. We, we said we were going to finish five, but this is be, this is taking too long. And I don't think. What do you think about that? Yeah, um, that's fine. Did you want to finish? You want to finish chapter three and then of just. Of course. Stop? Of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean. You know, just do, let's not let's leave four and five for later on because this is yeah like sorry this. guys we'll we'll you know we'll be back for four and five but yeah, chapter yeah, yeah. three is very 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 important and yeah so this is one of my now this is one of my favorite parts the upagrahas. this is this is where we get i mean we never heard of upagrahas no nope. no and let's be honest here let's be honest here Lars Panaro. 
Nobody fucking uses upagrahas. <laughs> Nobody knows how to explain upagrahas. That's true. And if they use it, they only use gulika. They only use gulika. Even Jamie only mentions gulika. Even and like Saravali and Palapadika. And not only that, there's a discussion between is, is Mandi gulika, is gulika Mandi, or oh, they yeah. different. Mm -hmm. You know, some people say they're different. Some people say it's the same. But the thing is that nobody knows what these upagrahas are for. Nobody can explain it to you. You know, uh, you know, there's the idea that upagrahas do good in, in upachayas, you know, but nobody really explains what are these points. And, you yeah. know, you and me, especially you've come with the idea that's, that's very plausible, that these are some types of pseudo lots. Yeah, yeah, they're similar to Hellenistic lots. Right, they're, they're similar to Hellenistic lots. And really we have upagrahas, which are listed here. And then I've heard the other ones later on, like Gulika and stuff called Aprakash grahas. Like some people call them that. Let's, let's read the, the shlokas so that people can- Cool, yeah, so non-luminous upagrahas. So add four it's signs- just for people, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. For people to know, upagrahas is just a, a category per se of grahas. There are grahas, they are chaya grahas, which are the nodes, the right? nodes yeah. which are like smoky planets, right? Because they can shadowy they, points. They're like not shadowy physical, points. They're mathematical yeah. points for eclipses. And then you have upa grahas. Upa means sub. So they're yeah. sub planets. And they're basically mathematical points, just like the lots are. Yes, continue. Yeah. Sorry. So, okay. Add four signs, 13 degrees and 20 minutes of arc to the sun's longitude at any given moment to get the exact position of the all inauspicious Duma. Reduce Duma from 12 signs to arrive at vi vi Vietapata, sorry, Vietapata is also inauspicious. Add six signs to Vietapata to know the position Vietipata, of Parivesha. Vietipata, yeah. Parivesha. He is Parivesha. extremely inauspicious. To the Parivesha <laughs> from 12 signs to arrive at the position of Chapa, Indra Danus, Indra Danus yeah. who is also inauspicious. Add 16 degrees, 40 minutes to Chapa, which will give Upa Ketu, who is a malefic. By adding a sign to Upa Ketu, you get the original longitude of the sun, meaning you're back at the beginning. These are planets devoid of splendor, which are malefics by nature and cause affliction. So the idea here is obviously based upon the sun and adding these mathematical ratios to the sun's position and then doing all this. And, you know, I'm not completely sure why these, why these particular mathematical principles, it's really not explained, but the idea is that if one of these planets in my, this is my opinion. If one of these planets is closely conjoined or maybe opposing another planet, an actual planet, then it can cause some kind of problem or represent some kind of issue. But the problem is we don't really know how to use these. Like supposedly some astrologers have likened them to like different planets that like yeah, the, son of the, 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 the children of different planets. Yeah. yeah. Like Duma is similar to Mars and Vyatipata is, I forget, maybe similar to, see, I don't even remember. I don't like, remember. It's I don't so remember. bizarre that, that it, it, that's just something people did to try to make heads or tails of this. But Parashara doesn't seem to say that. Well, here. Parashara, later on, Parashara, in another chapter, he, he kind yeah. of gives the results per house. But right. let's be honest, uh, most astrologers seldom do these upagrahas. You're, you're probably not going to see many videos on YouTube of astrologers talking about the results of these upagrahas. And and basically, people and we're gonna see this with other things, uh, with for, for example, uh, pranapada and and the different lagnas that we're gonna be discussing in other chapters. You know, you either get people who don't use these, or you get people who use these in different ways. But yeah. but I mean, there's no no real explanation to why you gotta do all these calculations. Yeah. You know, you know, lot of spirit, lot of fortune that you get in Hellenistic. That's very simple. You know, you, you're yeah. either born day or night and then, you know, you, you yeah. do the sun and moon longitude and voila, you know. And, and but here, it's very complicated. And, and I mean, not, not really, you know, th this is an area, this is a field of study in Yotish that really requires a lot of investigation and research to really delve into the into what this really means. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. And and what's interesting here is this shloka makes no sense to me, this next one, 65, because it says, if one of these afflicts the sun, well, how can it afflict the sun? If by, by opposition, I guess. No, I no, because they're the same calculation from any sun. So how could they, how could it possibly, that would mean in every chart, one of these would have to afflict the sun. By, by, maybe by Parivartan, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe, but otherwise, I mean, I, I'm not seeing it. It just doesn't make sense to me. And so the natives dynasty will decline while the moon and the ascendant respectively associated one of these will destroy the longevity and wisdom and so on. So obviously um, there's some something missing here. Like maybe if it's with the sun by Navamsha, I could see that. You know, um, but yeah, there's not going to be with the sun. You know, Jamie, Jamie mentions Gulika and he, he mentions it in relation to, to poisons and, and Rahu. Uh, and Gulika, yeah. uh, uh, as I'm aware of, Gulika is basically the son of Saturn. Uh, it, it's basically the yeah. idea behind Gulika is that there was this, I'm sorry for our Indians friend, uh, there was this devil that wanted to change the planets and he wanted to have the planets in perfect positions. Okay. And then he had Saturn in the 12th house, but then Saturn moved and he, then he dropped his sword and then it cut some part of Saturn and that became Gulika. Um, oh, okay. And position of Gulika in a chart usually uh, gives negative uh, quality. Oh, I've seen it show up very negatively actually when i've used it and i don't always use it but yeah uh, yeah but really people really don't know how to use it that's the thing i mean what does it mean i mean well i've seen it let's see i've seen it like conjoined somebody's rahu in the 12th while they were in rahu mahadasha and they were really really struggling even more than like normal rahu stuff might indicate i've seen it i think i saw it conjoined somebody's jupiter once it could have been another upagraha as well and during like Rahu Jupiter, they got like addicted to heroin or something like that. So, I mean, I have definitely seen it reveal things where I was looking at the, the you know, the Mahadasha and the Buktis and stuff. And I was like, well, why, why did they have a, such a hard time? Oh, there's this uh, Gulika, like, like within degrees, like two degrees of that planet or something. So you're right. It's not really like, there's no clear rationale of like what it does. I just think of it kind of like the lot of nemesis in Hellenistic astrology, where that's the, the lot for Saturn. Nemesis can just be very, very malefic, like just very inauspicious, you know? Um, I think Gulika is similar, you know? It's just like this really inauspicious thing. It's like a blight. It's like a, um, and psychologically, it's like a, a major, like it can be very depressive and blighted and dark, you know? So, but yeah, you're right. There's not like a clear way. And, and what even is Gulika? Well, he explains it here, right? That you basically divide up the duration of the week into eight parts and eighth portion is lordless. The seventh portion is distributed to seven planets cons uh, commencing from the lord of the weekday. And whichever portion is ruled by Saturn will be the portion of Gulika. But to be honest, I don't understand how you calculate that into the longitude of the chart. Like it's not really clear to me. And Samtanam does give some notes, yeah. but yeah. I don't get and, it. And um, let's, let's, let's do an apart here. You know, it, there's a debate in the Yotish community and most of our Indians friends that, that know about this can, can write it down. You know, there's a lot of debate between what Gulika is and if Gulika is the same as Mandi because apparently Parashar gives some calculations and there are other astrologers who give other calculations and call it Mandi, right? And Santanam, you know, at the, at the very preface of, of, of Brihat Parashar Harashastra of this edition, we have, he mentions that, that this edition is going to clarify the idea of what Gulika is. And I believe he, yeah. he concludes that they're the same thing. I'm not sure. I haven't read it. Yeah, Santanam seems to conclude that. Um, but I was going to say that, like, Mandy is representative of that girl in high school that you, like, just really want to get with, but she just won't get with you. I don't know what you're talking about because I, I, I got with all the girls I wanted to in high school because I wasn't a loser. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you must have an exalted Mandy in your chart, huh? Yeah. Oh, my God. There's um, a song, actually, Mandy. Um, 
There's a song. I bet, like yeah. An old 50 song. Yeah, whatever. Let's continue. I'm sure, yeah. Anyway, so the uh, so in addition to Gulika, you also have these other portions of the, di the this weird calculation that are, you know, called these here, y Yamangantaka and Arda Paraha and Kala and Ritu and stuff. And they are supposedly also correspond to planets. And I guess um, Santanam gives like, um, he says from this text, Kiranuru Nataraja of Jatakalankaram uh, gives signs of dignities for these Upagrahas. So yeah. this may be where, I, you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical about this kind of thing. It's just... Yeah, it's, it's just like random. the exaltations of, of, yeah. of the nodes. I mean, this has to be taken with a grain of salt. Oh, and then this is how to get Gulika's position, but it's still not really clear to me, so I don't want to try to explain it. You know, I'm sure somewhere on the internet somebody's explained it really well. Um, I prefer to just use the lots because I can calculate them in my head very quickly, and they're a similar thing. And, they're hidden and, themes. And let me tell you, you know, I, I, in my channel, I've, I've interviewed a famous uh, Spanish-speaking astrologer called Jose Garcia, and he told me, that from his school of Jyotish from Kerala in India, they use Gulika for some for for, for many things related to uh, medical astrology. So Ooh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, because it's poisons, and and you know the only clear reference we get from Gulika, and we're gonna get Gulika references in a lot of uh, uh, Parashara um, shlokas, not a lot, but uh, some. But in, yeah. in Jaimini. You know, he's associated to venom and to like toxins in the body yeah. that can cause uh, difficulty. So in a way, what we can conclude is that upagrahas are negative. <laughs> That's something that that is, is usually, you know, the idea here, or at least, you know, they're not gentle uh, upagrahas. Yeah. And, and a common theme, as I mentioned, is that they do good in upachaya houses, 3, 6, 10, and 11. Yeah, yeah. Right, and we'll we'll talk about those shlokas later, and those. Oh, are and really we're gonna talk. And we're gonna talk when when Parash. There's a chapter of Parashara where he talks about the positions of the Upagrahas. Yeah, it's really interesting. Are seldom discussed by astrologers. I and, really like those chapters, admittedly, yeah, even though yeah. I don't really use these. I just think it's like it helped me to think about how to use Hellenistic lots. Actually, I applied like a similar logic. It's the same like, principle, yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll talk about that later. But no, and it would be interesting to see if you could like extrapolate time systems from these upagrahas, also. Sure. You know, oh, and, and and let's be honest, upagrahas are not mentioned in Yamana Yataka. No. And this is more or less at the same time that, you know, Persian Arab astrology was starting out and they did a lot of things with, with lots. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not unreasonable to think that these are, in essence, lots. And that, you know, I don't know. I mean, Upagrahas well, are mysterious. One thing I like about Indian astrologers, like past, present, future, is that they've always been experimenting with like very strange things. And so Indian astrology has a lot of stuff that is like, that just doesn't make much sense, but <laughs> it's also like very complicated. And, and I just, I just, I enjoy it. I don't always use these uh, things cause they're, some of them are just too complicated like this, but, but uh, I, I think it's cool. You know, I think it's really cool how much they like, they, they went out there and you know, who knows what the rationale for this was. Like, it would be so interesting if somebody one day really discovered it by something other than circular logic, which seems to be a very common theme by astrologers these days, explaining everything with circular logic. But, um, but yeah, until then, it's a mystery, you know. So, yeah, let's go to this last part, which I believe... Is, the, is an Here we go. is is not supposed to be in this chapter because it has nothing to do with Man, let me tell you about pranapada which nobody uh, knows what pranapada is yeah what the hell is this okay like, basically prana is like you know prana the thing you come yeah, to get the life the force pala is like the foot so it's basically like a pala of any house it's basically the idea of the, the pala of the life force now i did some research on this and i've asked my my teachers okay know, uh, some people say that Pranapala is a sensitive point and that it, it gives a lot of information. And some sure. Indians say that, that the use of Pranapala is like uh, it's reserved from so, for some oral traditions. 
that are not explained in books. Oh, preserved from oral preserved, tradition. Yeah. But you know, everybody, everybody that talks about Pranapala cites Mr. B.B. Raman on these, on this, you know, the B.B. Raman books, the, the little square books. Okay. And, and he talks about studies in Jaimini and they all refer to him. And the only thing Mr. Uh, Raman has to say about Pranapala is, and I quote, <laughs> a certain sensitive point. That's it. <laughs> Holy shit. Wow. Well, that's what I figured when I read this. I had completely forgotten about this. And I was like, okay, so it's a sensitive point that can kind of, it's, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the yogi point or the ava yogi, which I actually prefer yeah. to this because it just makes And sense. once again, this is something that is seldom discussed by astrologers and you do, you know. Well, and I think this is in the wrong, I don't think this belongs in this chapter. It may not even belong in this book. Like it's not, it's totally out of context. It kind of like almost pissed me off when I read it because I was like, what the fuck <laughs> is this doing here? And, you know, like, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, like our mutual friend Ashwin, like he was like, yeah, I don't use that. I don't use like any of these things. And he has, he has a strong lineage, you know? So it's one of these things where, is it valid? Absolutely. Like I, if I was going to use this, I would probably use it to like find out something about the person's prana. Like where, where is your astrology. prana, bala, for example, do you know? Oh my God. Okay. Wait. Uh, no, I would have to, I would have to do this calculation. Well, I, I have it in the 12th. So okay. if people know what that means, you know, you can write it down. I mean, but it says here that it does good in the second, fifth, ninth, fourth, 10th and 11th. Right. So, you know, basically I think it's one of those things where you would use it in tandem with more fundamental techniques to yeah. uh, assess a person's, like chart in terms of the auspiciousness or inauspiciousness yeah, yeah. it's but yeah it's just fun it's just funny it's just and, like, and, you, can, and you can combine that with uh the other special lacnas that we're going to be discussing in terms of uh baba lacna a eh, gatika lacna and hora lacna which are going to be in the next chapters but yeah. once again we don't know what pranapala is for if you have the secret, uh, please write it down on YouTube comments. <laughs> yeah, uh, please, please. But I, I guess it has to do, you know, what is prana? Prana is things you take in, the akash maybe, the energy. Yeah, uh, the life force. From the air, from the light, from the food, whatever. And and you inhale it and it, and it nurtures your body. So it probably has to do with something of, of nurturing, of energy, of, of how your energy manifests itself. Because we have yeah. to remember pala is a foot. And Pala is basically like the result of something. It's like you playing Mario and you hit the box and you hit the coin. Well, the coin is the Pala. You know, that's that's the final result, the point you get. Sure. So, that's you a, know, a way I to look know. at it. Yeah. I don't know. So, yeah, we finished chapter three. Cool. I want to say, you know, sure. for people out there, and I'm going to plug another. Wow, well, we plugged a lot of books so far in chapter yeah. three. Already. I want people to know that chapter three is of supreme importance to know, you know, Astrology is a language. The letters are the planets, you know, the paragraphs are the signs, you know, and, and the houses are, are the body, you know, are the books. You know, you need to learn what the planets mean. And I recommend this book. Uh, this is not for beginners. Uh, I recommend this book after you kind of have a solid Jyotish background. And then you get into this book before getting into classics, which is Graha Sutras by sure. Ernst Wilhelm. He basically takes all the significant shlokas and sutras from different classics, specifically for Ashra, and, and he kind of gets, uh, this is basically, a, what's it called? Um, a collection of Vedic shlokas and, shoot and sutras in relation to the significations of the planets. Yeah. Because A, you need to learn these, and B, there are a lot of shilokas that contradict each other throughout the classics, you know. Saravali says something, Paladipika says something, Grihajataka says something, yeah. Karashtra says something, uh, Kalmrita says something else, you know, there, yeah. there are a lot of classics. And I recommend this book because Ernst uh, does it, he also uh, adds some commentary, but you kind of get the nitty gritty of what planets mean. And, and you know, you have, before you do Jyotish, you have to realize, you know, that for example, Jupiter is jello, Jupiter, I mean, not jello, though, thank you. I mean, the color jello. You know, Jupiter is, is <laughs> <laughs> Jupiter is fat. And, like, you need to know that the sun is, like, heavy clothes, you know, like, like, woolly clothes, like, from wool, like, okay. clothes that, that keep you warm. 
that yeah. the sun represents vowels, that the sun is like the king and so on and so forth. And you get this from this book. And this with Parasha, you know, it's, it's a great way to, to study. Yeah, it's a really good book. I agree. I have the PDF. Especially in relation to chapter three. Yeah. Um, I would also recommend Light on Life by oh. Art Defoe and Robert Svoboda because they also go over a lot of these these uh, significations and just give a, a brief explanation of like how they can be used. Yeah, this is my favorite modern textbook. Right here. On Jyotish. Uh, Another Robert. great book. By yeah. the way, I'm, you know, I did this in my, in my channel. I'm going to recommend the four books I recommend for people to study astrology since chapter three is such a basic uh, in basic and important yeah. uh, chapter. I want to plug the four books, I think. Well, they're five, okay. but I'm going to plug the four books I okay. think are the best books to start Jyotish. So, uh, give me one second. I'm going to look for the books. Okay. Okay, cool. So, yeah, while Fernando does that, um, I will say that basically with all of this stuff, you know, it's good to read different classical texts of the same tradition and even different traditions and see what makes the most sense to you or resonates with you the most because again they all do disagree slightly on these sort of more tertiary things right every text will tell you that the the sun is you know the giver of life and light and is symbolic of like you know the truth and the soul and things like that but not every text will agree on um like maybe what body part the sun rules or or yeah. sometimes you know well they'll, they'll all agree that he rules the heart right but they won't all, like you know we saw that Parashara says bones for the sun yet many other yeah. texts say saturn so you know we have to we have to see we have to see what makes sense to us and use that really yeah. so lars i want to recommend you know fernando's top four books cool I want to recommend I, the, for beginners, for people who are seeing this, you know, I don't recommend you, you know, to learn Yotish, to go right to the classics. You first need a solid base in order to enter the classics. Sure. And I recommend these four books, five, but there are four actually. So the best Yotish book I recommend is, I'm sorry, you got to go? No, no, no. I, I have a few more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is, this is really fast. You know, the best book I recommend Beneath the Vedic Sky by William Levesey. Okay. There is no such thing as a Vedic astrology for dummies, but this book is amazing because it seems, you know, you start reading it and it seems so superficial, but then as you go into it, you know, William Levesey, rest in peace, he just died of, uh, a year ago, more okay. or less. You know, he goes into each thing, you know, systematically, and then he, he deepens the study and at the very end, he's, he's touching things that are extremely complicated. And he doesn't even finish the touching upon them as, as complicated as they are. But this wow. is a great book to study Jyotish. Wow. Now, uh, another great book that we just mentioned, Light on Life, very traditional, very good. Robert Svoboda, Heart to Foe. I mean, this is a great classical, traditional Jyotish book. It's not necessarily related to any type of parampara specifically. But I mean, this Wait, is what do you mean? Uh, uh, that it's not related to like a school of like thought. Like no, uh, no, it is, it is. They had a guru. They had like a really oh, oh. legit traditional. Yo, no, no. But I mean, it's it's not like they uh, have a school per se. I mean, oh. they have a lineage, but yeah, they don't have yeah, like a place where you can go and learn. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, there is a parampara, but it's not okay. like other people that have a school and, and all that. But this is a great traditional book. It has a lot of significations of the planets, just like uh, Graha Sutras, and it's a great way to start. Sure. Then the other one I would recommend, Dr. Frawley. This is a great book, The Astrology cool. of the Seers. Uh, I mean, Dr. Frawley is an amazing man. You know, he's very popular in India. Cool. And, and David Frawley, you know, this is for a while, this was a classic. And once again, very precise very good and it deepens into subjects and finally you know i recommend my teacher's books ryan kursak and 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 his is his uh two, two volumes right and richard fish which are the art and science of vedic astrology volume one and volume two this is once again very basic very intrinsic and very important for you to have the basics so you nice. know with, with those five books you know You're you set. have it yeah. set
And I, you know, I wanted to plug these books because we're talking about chapter three. And this is probably like most people read until chapter three and they don't read anything more about Parashara. Right. Probably like these videos, people are gonna see until this this video and then they're gonna, you know, ignore yeah. the other videos. <laughs> well, good stuff. Yeah, I think, I think uh, once I, yeah, once I combine this with the other videos, it's gonna be a pretty long video. So for those of you who made it to the end, that's awesome. Thank you. Like, and you know, don't forget to share this around, like the channel, check out Fernando's channel and website, my website and all the links and all that good stuff. If you enjoyed this and you know, we'll be back uh, for some more chapters. Uh, yeah, we did it until three and we wanted to make it to five, but yeah, yeah. but oh, uh, we man. have to go because we have to go to our Sai Baba service right now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're in we're in orange, yeah. That's the yeah. We're in orange, yeah. And, and I almost have an afro, but not yeah. quite, right? I love Sai Baba. Yeah. Anyway, um, cool. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks again, and uh, we'll see everybody next time. Peace.